بسم الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بدر منصور we can't hear you for some reason <laughs> can you hear me now yes بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله أما بعد we are thrilled الحمد لله to have this live stream we want to welcome our brothers inshallah we'll introduce uh, a little bit later on to a very special program in this live stream with the MRM team in Malaysia the Huawei stream is so thrilled to announce that it is making a big leap into the east west dawa collaboration with Ustad Firdaus Wong and his team at MRM now Mr Firdaus Sheikh Firdaus and brother Kaleem are very familiar names to many of you probably uh, as well uh, you know as myself Mansoor and Ustad Hashim from speakers corner videos and inshallah we will get to know brother muhammad uh, from the always um, closely as well now going online in such a manner is a recent phenomenon i mean we all know this this was a result of covid necessity uh, due to the lockdown and issues like this uh, can you still hear me right you're fading yeah, we can, yeah. you keep fading in and out for some okay let me just Check my microphone. Is it, is it any better? There we go. That, that's better. Yes. So what I was saying, COVID has its advantages, of course, but it has allowed us to to go and with these live streams and we can actually have this cooperation and collaborations. This is Qadar of Allah. It's, it's a huge blessing in, in, a, in one way. So globally, many brothers and sisters have told us that they're benefiting from these recorded discussions. Alhamdulillah. So what you may know that... Um, we not we are not going to speak a corner just recently you know just with the introduction of the cameras we have been going there long before the cameras were at place and long before the youtube and social media arrived at the scene and we will be talking about this inshallah because this is one particular dawa model that we want to share with you globally as well and i'm sure you're familiar with this from our speakers corner videos but in fact nothing beats actual live discussions and face to face interactions this is after all the prophetic model uh, and we have noticed, unfortunately, that there's a worrying trend in the Dawa model, influenced by, unfortunately, profit motive and corporate organizations. So simply, no Islamic activity should be run like a business. This is what we want to highlight, inshallah, in this session too. The corporate model of Dawa is providing a very destructive for the long-term interests of the target audience, i.e. those who are inviting people to Islam. Slowly but surely, enmity unfortunately has sprung up between institutes and superstar personality syndrome is becoming very apparent. Islamic ethics and norms are being violated in pursuit of competitive advantage and beating the opponents. In today's conversation, inshallah, we will provide guidance on how to navigate these challenges with the live experience from the front lines of Dawa, the brothers um, from the MRM team, and inshallah we'll share our experience. So let us now introduce, and uh, first of all, assalamu alaikum to all of you. Can you can you hear me still? Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Perfectly now, alhamdulillah. Okay. MashaAllah. Sorry about my microphone uh, issues. So welcome once again to uh, from Dawa Wise team, Brother Muhammad and Brother Hashim, and from the MRM team, Ustad Firdaus Myong and Brother Kaleem Said. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi to all of you. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Right, so I think it would be better for us to get some introduction about the team you have in Malaysia, Sheikh Firdaus, and just, just let us learn more about yourself, because from the Western you know, perspective, not many of us are familiar in the works that you do and who you are, so would you mind just giving some brief introduction to yourself, inshallah, and your team? Sure, inshallah. Jazakumullah khairan to uh, Brother Mansur, Brother Muhammad, and Brother Hashim from Dakwa Wise, alhamdulillah. Uh, to yeah. all my brothers and sisters in Islam and in humanity all around the world. And uh, assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh to every one of you. Uh, well, um, I think uh, you should call me, address me as uh, Brother Fidaus rather than Ustaz or Sheikh. <laughs> I think uh, both three of you from UK are more deserving of that uh, title more than me. Um, now, uh, just a short introduction about myself. Uh, I'm a revert uh, to Islam, in which I reverted to Islam uh, back in 2005. So this year is 17 years, alhamdulillah. Uh, yes, 17 years, alhamdulillah. 
okay, being a Muslim. Um, well, I'm a reward, Chinese reward from a Buddhist family, uh, rewarded in 2005, and uh, now, uh, and I have founded a multiracial rewarded Muslim, MRM, here in Malaysia, with a pure focus on the, doing straight da'wah here in Malaysia, and only locally. But Qadar Allah, uh, Allah have a different plan for us, in which uh, on the first year itself, Allah have already allowed us uh, to explore and venture uh, into other part of the world. And the first uh, country that we went to is uh, Australia. And to be specific, is in Perth, where we are being invited to conduct a da'wah workshop. And then uh, fast forward eight years now, coming to eight years, next month will be our eight years anniversary, alhamdulillah. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have blessed us by allowing us this opportunity to do da'wah in different, different continents. If you're talking about in Asia, yes, Singapore, Indonesia, Thailand, Cambodia, Philippines, okay, uh, Saudi, Hong Kong, Macau. Uh, I mean, alhamdulillah, there's a blessing. And of course, in Europe, been to UK in 2014 and to Netherlands, as, as well as uh, in Africa, been to Uganda, Zambia, Zimbabwe, Botswana, South Africa. Um, and recently, 2019, there's a reason one. We went to Tanzania. And of course, uh, one of the most uh, memorable experience that we have so far is that uh, we have been invited to uh, the Latin, which is to Peru and to Colombia to conduct that workshop and to meet our brothers and sisters in which they are minorities uh, over there in Peru and Colombia. And, and alhamdulillah, I would say, again, uh, just by words, we could not thank Allah enough because uh, history was made during our trip to to Peru, in which, according to the representative of the Christians over there, in which, according to him, Mr. Mario, he said that in Peru history, this is the first time ever that they have a dialogue between Muslim and Christians. So for them, they are very happy with such an engagement as well. So Alhamdulillah. And here in Malaysia, we have been everywhere. And of course, uh, the way how we know Brother Mansur and uh, Brother Hashim, you guys from... Uh, Speaker Corner and Dawah Wise right now, in which, uh, alhamdulillah, we have been uh, watching them and also translate, doing some subtitle for their videos. And alhamdulillah, uh, today with me, I have my teacher, I have my facilitator, and also now, alhamdulillah, he is uh, full time with uh, MRM as our Dawah manager. So I will let him to introduce himself, Brother Khalid. Subhanallah, Jazakumullah, very beautiful. Okay. Uh, are we going to play the video first, inshallah? I think we should go ahead with the video first. Okay. And, um, a little bit more, inshallah. So let's play the video and um, then we'll get sure. Brother Kalim to introduce himself formally, inshallah. Okay. okay, nice. <laughs>
Mashallah. Mashallah, mashallah. Very, very beautiful video um, explaining a lot of what you do. So we'll hear more about it, inshallah, from you, Brother Kaleem. Tafaddal. <laughs> mashallah. Jazakumullah khairan. Nahmaduhu wa nusalli ala rasulihil kareem. Amma ba'd. Assalamu alaikum once again to all of you, to all the viewers nice. watching us on this live stream on Firdos Wong Wai Hung official channel as well as on Dawa Wai's YouTube and Facebook page. Uh, by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, I have been into the field of Dawa for the past two decades, alhamdulillah. I started doing one-to-one -one personal Dawa from my university days. And alhamdulillah, uh, in the year 2007, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fulfilled my dream to be a part of the best, suppose, inshallah, uh, Allah knows the best, uh, to be the part of the best Dawa organization in that part of the world that is India. And alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helped me to join Dr. Zakir Naik there. And I worked with him for a decade. And mashallah, uh, back there, uh, there is lots of Dawa done through the channel of media, especially the satellite TV media and the social media. And basically, it's all about the public talks and the trainings that which I have been trained and I have been myself a trainer there uh, while I was working with him. But subhanAllah, since the past five years, uh, I have come here into Malaysia and I have learned a different phase of Dawah. That is street Dawah, which inshallah, Brother Firdos will be you know, talking more about it during the course of the program. And alhamdulillah, uh, you know, this is a new thing for me personally. Uh, you know, to uh, have done street dawah because we don't find such opportunities much in India, that part of the world. But Alhamdulillah, here in Malaysia, uh, you know, the government is supportive. And MashaAllah, uh, you know, and Brother Firdos has said, uh, you know, has set this flagship program so well that MashaAllah, there are so many people joining in uh, every week. We do this, Alhamdulillah, in the most, you know, the key uh, places in Malaysia, in Kuala Lumpur especially, Alhamdulillah. So that is all about me, uh, inshallah. It's not cheese ke liye, bas itna hi kafi hai. For those of you who understand Urdu, you know, I'm nobody. I believe, inshallah, this much is sufficient, inshallah. Barakallah. <laughs> so I just want to quickly um, let our audience know the format of uh, our session today, inshallah. We'll be talking about a lot of key concepts that we want to, you know, let this across very clearly. We'll be talking about, inshallah, the virtues of da'wah the obligations of doing da'wah, what are the roles of the da'i, the one who invites people to Allah, specifically the roles of education in this process, how do we deal with shubha or doubts that come along, the issues of scientism itself, how do we invite different groups, not just one particular community or faith community, what is the influence the West is having on the da'wah and the way we do da'wah, and specifically also the benefits of, you know, Speaker's Corner contents, how this can be used and utilized in a global context, contextually. More also, do's and don'ts, what you should be doing and not doing in the dawah, in the models that you approach. And the skills, are we going to have soft skills? What about our voice, our tones, um, issues of empathy? And finally, inshallah, we'll be taking questions and answers for the audience to help uh, understand this concept that we are discussing, inshallah. But at the, at the very outset, I want to just remind everyone, Dawaise is taking this initiative, inshallah, this model in which it's going to be uniting the Muslims, you know, uniting, collaborating, helping each other in, in goodness and piety, inshallah. This is the model that we want to take, and we want to bridge this gap from the East and the West to bring the Muslim dua to come together together in, in a platform that we can share ideas and concepts, work together and also reduce our work burden um, and also be very conductive and very fruitful dawah inshallah worldwide. So Brother Muhammad and uh, Brother Hashim, um, before we go into the actual discussion on these specific key topics, um, please come in and um, we would like to say go ahead. Yeah, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, nahmadu wa salli ala rasulil kareem. I'm Abad. Uh, Alhamdulillah, really honored to be um, on this panel uh, with uh, Brother uh, Fedos and Brother Muhammad, sorry, bro uh, Brother Kalim. Alhamdulillah, uh, so really um, great to be connecting with the side of the world that we rarely do so far. So this is going to be a game changer for us as well, because we are now uh, outreaching towards the Eastern 
hemisphere, I would say. We we mostly dealt with the the European and the American side so far, so bringing on guests from that side of the world. And it is only fair that we expand to the other side of the world. Uh, so that you need to come closer to your microphone. Yeah. So people know that we are united in our mission, which is basically... still a bit muffled, sorry. Is it? Okay. You're better now, better now, alhamdulillah. Yeah. So uh, I think this microphone is okay. So we have to be quite close to him. Uh, so yeah, so I was just saying that we, as uh, Brother Mansour mentioned, we have to be united in our uh, mission, which is basically to spread the word of uh, Islam, the word of uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, so this is the purpose of our existence, isn't it? It's exactly in the Quran that we have been created to spread the word of Allah. Um, Brother Hashim, if I, I just may interrupt, I think if you touch your microphone, I think one of the cables may be a little bit loose. That's why it's going on and off. Try yeah, speaking. Something, something keeps dropping in and out. I, or or yeah. maybe... Yeah. Our apologies to our audience um, for these technical issues that we're having. How is it now? Better. Okay, that's much okay. better. Alhamdulillah. So what I was saying is that uh, we have to, as our cause is basically to spread the, the message of Islam to the world in different parts of the world and even in different languages because people don't just speak English. So Alhamdulillah, with our outreach to people in Malaysia, Indonesia, these countries where there are large populations of Muslims, Alhamdulillah, and who might uh, be able to also get involved in this uh, really worthy cause of da'wah, uh, which is the legacy of the prophets. So Alhamdulillah, this is a noble cause and we would uh, like to see people across the world to come into uh, play with this uh, particular mission, which is for all the Muslims. And we have to actually educate ourselves as how to communicate and how to give the hour, how to attain knowledge uh, in the correct way so that we can actually go about this particular mission. And this is where people of experience like uh, Brother Firdaus and Brother Kalim, mashallah, who have got um, quite a quite a number of years of experience in this particular field who can help and, and particularly that team. So it's not just people knowledgeable in, in, in Islam, but also all those people with their technical know-how, how to create videos, how to edit them, how to basically spread the uh, word on different platforms, different social media platforms. You're breaking up again, Brother Hashim. Yeah. Inshallah, I won't take up much time. I'll try to fix this <laughs> um, this microphone. Uh, so I'll hand it to Brother Muhammad, inshallah. How's my voice before I start? Is everything really yeah. okay? Alhamdulillah. Okay. Assalamu alaikum. Bismillah. Alhamdulillah. Salatu wassalamu ala rasulillah. Um, so I'm number three of the Dawah Ice team. Uh, most people don't not don't know about this, and, and I prefer it not to be known. I prefer to work in the background mostly. Uh, my focus is primarily on... Um, education, research, and also really sort of long-term thinking. And, and one of the things that we're focused on, especially in this collaboration, is really to create a way forward that is scalable and that reaches into the far corners of the world. I mean, it, it's all very well, for example, doing da'wah to the urbanized environments. What about the people in the villages? What about the people who don't get to come to the urbanized environments? How do we reach out to those? How do we get the message out to them in a way that they can consume and understand that this invitation to Islam is open to all of mankind? And we must at least do our job, at least do the part. At the end of the day, that's the best we can do. And so in pursuit of this, uh, we're bringing like-minded individuals from across the globe um, everybody has their own approach. And, and just as Rasulullah told us, he said, you know your community better than those outside of your community. Something to that effect. And so it is better that you do da'wah to your people with support and models that scale from elsewhere, and then you customize them as needed. And this is largely what we will be discussing today. Uh, the do's and don'ts of how to, if you want to set up a, um, let's say, an effort locally, or you wish to collaborate with uh, Brother Fardaus or Brother Kaleem, then how should you do this in a manner that is part, that is sort of aligned to the prophetic model? So, Zakala, let me sort of leave it there. Brother Mansour, back to you. 
Barakallah fi. So let's start with understanding first of all um, what exactly is when we say da'wah because this is where we begin to understand the models that are in place in doing da'wah. Um, so I'm going to start asking uh, brother, my brother Sheikh Ferdos in terms of what exactly is da'wah first of all. When we say da'wah and we invite him to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before we go into the virtues what exactly is da'wah? When we say we want to do da'wah, what does it refer to? What does it actually mean? Okay, cool. Now, uh, when we refer to da'wah, I mean, if let's say you're coming from this Indian subcontinent, you might have a different meaning. And that might uh, let Kalim to explain about da'wah, right? They have a different meaning when it comes to that part of the world. Now, when it comes to our understanding as a Muslim, um, first and foremost, I would like to say that uh, da'wah is an, basically an obligation upon every Muslim, okay, is an obligation upon every single Muslim. Because our Prophet Sallallahu said that, aniwalo ayah, convey from me even one ayah. And uh, just for your information, I think, uh, because just now, it's just a brief introduction for us to understand. Um, yes, I embraced Islam in 2005, but uh, only by in 2011, after I have met Sheikh Hussein Yi, after I attended one of the reward gathering, in which I started to learn more about the deen, okay? And one of the first few advice that he have gave me was to do da'wah. And during that time, the word da'wah is very alien to me being a new revert, okay? And then I give a lot of excuses. I say, well, those born Muslim, they are not doing it. Why me? Why it is me? Why not them? You know, why I need to do? I say, I didn't know a lot about Islam. How if people ask me certain questions that I don't know, okay? That I don't know the answer. And I continue to give my excuse. And I say, Sheikh, I don't have enough knowledge. And he answered me, Fridaus, what do you recite in order to become a Muslim? I say that once, inshallah, I remember. I recite, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. And then Sheikh Husseini told me, well, that is sufficient. I'm looking at him and I was like, what do you mean that is sufficient? And then he quoted, Baligu ani walo ayah. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say, convey from me even one ayah. And in your shahada, you have two ayah. So, just one. That's it. Islam is very simple. You convey whatever you know. So basically, brothers and sisters, all around the world, da'wah is an obligation upon every single one of us to the best of our abilities. Okay? Whatever you can do. And if, if we were to say, oh, but... I can't. It's too difficult. Well, it's either you are speaking the truth or Allah is speaking the truth. In Surah Al-Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 216, where Allah says, La nafsan illa Allah will not overburden a soul more than he can bear. And when Allah and his messenger have already made something obligatory, that meaning, everybody, every single person, they can do it. But then, we come along and we say, oh, I can't. It's beyond my ability. So it's either you are speaking the truth. If you are speaking the truth, then you are accusing Nauzwila. Hopefully you are not. You are accusing Allah of lying by saying, when Allah says, La yukallifullahu nafsan illa usaha. Either one. It's only either one. Okay? So it's basically, you can do the best that you can do. And that one, basically, brothers and sisters, is to invite, is to call. Now, we have to make it very clear. Uh, some of us who are even involved in da'wah, and please, Brother Mansour and uh, Brother Hashim and Brother Muhammad, please correct me if I'm wrong, that even people who are involved in da'wah, sometimes we have a distorted understanding about what da'wah is all about. We thought that da'wah is all about speaking good, inviting people to Islam, talking people, uh, tell them about Islam, share with them about what Islam is all about, to, uh, in, and introduce to them who is Allah, I beg to differ in, in that context. I would love to beg to differ. Because when we refer back to the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clearly said in Surah Al Imran, chapter 3, verse 64, where I'll say, Kul ya alu kitab, say to the people of the book, Ta'alaw, come, come to common terms between us and you. Ta'alaw ila kalimatin sawa in bainana wa bainakum. And then Allah says, you invite people to Allah. Let's worship only Allah. This is Amar Ma'ruf. But then Allah didn't stop there. 
Allah says, "Wala nushika bin shay'an," and do not associate any partners with me. Meaning, that one is not really about talking good about what Islam is all about, inviting people to know about Allah or worshiping Allah. But we also have to do the nahi bunkar. So that one generally it means when we look into prophetic, the way of the prophet. Okay, the way of the prophet, in which does all the prophet, they come just to talk about who is Allah and inviting people to worship Allah, and they do not prevent or forbid the evil. No, they are not. And if we were to look into the Quran, and when we look into the Sirah of all the Anbiya, okay, we will realize that they are being opposed by their own people. Not merely because they call them to worship Allah, but they are being opposed and attacked by their own people because they forbid their people to worship other than Allah and to do all the munkar. If that one is merely really about inviting people to goodness, then Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam will have no problem at all. But the fact that Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was opposed, he was threatened. And he was about to be killed by the mushrikun. Why? All because he forbid, he prevent, he is doing the nahi munkar. So, brothers and sisters, that one generally is to do and to call people to goodness and to prevent the evil. And of course, there is a different different level of evil. And of course, the evil that Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala will not forgive if someone die with it. Is committing the sin of shirk, just like what Allah says in Surah An-Nisa, chapter four, verse forty-eight and verse one hundred and sixteen. But the best of Amal Ma'roof is, as Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Al-Fusilat, chapter forty-one, verse thirty-three: "Woman asanu kaula mimanda ilallah." Who is the best in speech than the ones who call people to Allah? So for us, it's very clear. But of course, there is a multiple way of doing da'wah, calling people to good, preventing evil, but. The pinnacle of it, the peak of it, is calling people to Allah, worshiping only Allah, and forbid and prevent the shirk. Allahu Akbar. I pass the mic back to you. Team in here. I mean, what exactly do you understand about dawah in in your part of the world, as referred to earlier on? <laughs> is it something else? <laughs> I just have to go back and repeat what Doctor Naik has been telling in all his lectures about dawah. Uh, wherein uh, we have the Urdu term Dawat, and whenever we hear the word Dawat, we think either about the chicken biryani or the mutton biryani. We think about the banquet. <laughs> so usually, when we talk about Dawa in the Indian subcontinent, what we are thinking about first is about the food. You're making so me hungry now, Kalim. <laughs> You're most welcome to come to my place. We have chicken biryani today. The Dawat. <laughs> So, but that's that's about dawa as has been uh, so well explained uh, by brother for those about uh, how dawa is so important it is a duty upon every muslim and he emphasized on the aspect of amr bil ma'ruf wan nahi anil munkar and that reminds me of one of the hadith of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam which is mentioned in sahih muslim the prophet said alayhi salatu wassalam man ra'a minkum munkaran falyughayyiruhu bi yadihi whosoever sees an evil should stop it with his hand. Should prevent it with his hand if he has the ability to do so. فَإِلَّمْ يَسْتَتِيَ And if he does not have the ability, then فَبِلِسَانِهِ With his tongue. So you speak against it. You don't become a mute spectator. You are not a silent spectator to the evil and the injustice and the wrong that which is happening towards you or around you. And we all know as Muslims and for the audience watching, the greatest injustice that which any human being can do while in this world is to associate partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is shirk. As Allah tabarak wa ta'ala says in Surah Nisa chapter 4, verse number 48, and in verse number 116, ma bi inna Allah, uh, Allah tabarak wa ta'ala, indeed Allah tabarak wa ta'ala does not forgive the sin of shirk. Anything other than shirk, he forgives to whomsoever he wills. So Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala has clearly mentioned here that the shirk is the greatest injustice. So if you cannot stop it with your hand, then do it with your tongue. And then Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, فَإِلَّمْ يَسْتَتِي 
If you cannot even do it so, then وَفِي قَلْبِهِ Then consider it to be an evil in your heart. ذَلِكَ عَذَفُ iman. And this is the lowest of faith. But in the present day scenario, as we see, there is uh, so much of calling by the people to different ideologies, to different thought processes, uh, to different cultures. As uh, I had heard Sheikh Abdul Rahim Green from UK saying okay, that in the present day world, you are either a Dai or you are a Madhu. There is no third option available now in the present day world. Either you are calling people towards Islam or people are calling you towards their way of life. Now you have to make the choice, my dear brothers and sisters. Are you going to be a Dai who is inviting people to the way of Allah? As Brother Firdaus said from Surah Fusilat, chapter 41, verse number 34. Waman that the best of one who speaks is the one who calls people towards Allah? Or are you going to be called by the different ideologies, by the different cultures, by the different religions, by the different ways of life that which people are living? So it's up to us to make the choice. And I believe as Muslims, we all want to attain the success that which Allah wa ta has promised to us. So we would want to do dawah and be amongst those who are successful, as Allah says in Surah Al Imran, chapter 3, verse number 104. Wal minkum ila and let there arise out of you a band of people calling towards good. Ta'muruna bil ma'roof wa tanhauna anil munkar. Inviting to all that is ma'roof, that is tawheed, and wa tanhauna anil munkar, and forbidding whatever is evil. Wa ula'ika humul muflihun. And these are the one who are the successful people. So I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we all understand and realize the importance of dawah in our life and strive to be the successful ones in this dunya and in the akhirah. Alhamdulillah, okay? Brother Kaleem. Uh, what I would add to that, and, and this is, I think, a beautiful reminder and a beautiful message is uh, at the end of the day, if when we bring it down to the very, very bottom line, it is about speaking the words of guidance that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed and inviting people to the purpose of their creation. Why were they created? It is answering that question for them. There are many, many philosophies out there today, many worldviews out there whose entire foundation is built on answering the question, why am I here? That's it. And they've been doing this for thousands of years and they still don't have an answer. And in the process, what have they done? They've created very, very complex webs of stories and myths and um, directionless seeking. Everybody takes their own path, arrives at something and they hold it up and say, I've arrived at truth. OK, but it's not your truth. It's my truth. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made a revelation that takes you away from that misguidance completely. And one of the hadith of Rasulullah sallam is whoever directs someone to do good will gain the same reward as the one who does the good. This for me is the foundational message of why we should do what we do. It's really simple. Once you've answered for somebody the question of why they exist, and their purpose in life, which is to worship Allah, then you show them how to worship. Then you can set them on the road to real freedom, to real, uh, what we would call enlightenment, if you want to use those words. I mean, I don't like them, but I know this is the terminology you will hear on the road in this part of the world because of the, of the background that it comes from. So, Brother Hashim. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, alhamdulillah. All right, good. <laughs> yes. Right, uh, so alhamdulillah, I think uh, we, we probably just have to now dig into, so the topic today we'll be covering is uh, called Dawa Connected, Building the Ecosystem. Uh, we just want to find out, I mean, you, you, you guys probably have seen a lot of our videos at Speaker's Corner, um, and we want to find out from other parts of the world how they conduct Dawa, uh, in their society, because it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's obvious that the cultures do differ in different parts of the world. So maybe at Speaker's Corner, you must have seen a lot of 
raising voices, uh, shouting and all that, that comes with the, what do you say, uh, with the environment at Speaker's Corner, unfortunately, something sometimes out of our control. So, so Brother Hashim, what, or yes. maybe Brother Mansur, why don't you spend a moment explaining exactly what the Speaker's Corner model is? Because I think a lot of people misunderstand. Yeah. What, so could you just a little bit of history as to where it came from? And then why the this sort of adversarial model has been has been created there? Could, could maybe one of you just for the for the audience to explain that? Yeah, inshallah. Um, and so you want to go ahead? Go ahead. Now can um, I? I, I can't okay. hear you. Looks like both our audios are suffering. Today. Yeah, for some reason. How about now? Is it any better? Uh, there we go. Yes. Yeah. Not sure. So happening. so yeah. So where did where and why is Speaker's Corner? First of all, let's start with that. Okay. Where mm -hmm. is it, first of all, and, and, and how did Corner, it come about? Speaker's Corner is in London, in the capital city, London and UK. There's a history to this particular place. Oh, I'm losing you. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah it's, uh, it's, 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 it's a bit breaking. Okay. It's breaking. So let's, let's Brother Hashim continue speaking <laughs> while I try to fix my mic as well. I do apologize. Yeah. Okay. Sorry about yeah. the technical problems. Technical today, issues yeah. today. So, Brother Hashim, why don't you tell us, okay, so wh where yeah. is it and, and so how did it go? Speaker's come Corner is in London, in Hyde Park, which is a royal park in London, in central London. Um, so, if you've been to London, it's basically at the end of Oxford Street. Um, and it's it's one of those places which has been, I think, kind of a bastion for freedom of speech. So you had people all the way back to time of Karl Marx, and uh, you know, I, th I believe even Lenin ha during his time they had been to Speaker's Corner spreading their messages. So anyone can go there um, on a Sunday. By the way, this uh, the Speaker's Corner is active only on a Sunday. So if you guys come uh, as tourists to London on some other day and think that Hashim and Mansoor are going to be that Speaker's Corner, no, we got other things to do during the week. So we are not there in Speaker's Corner 24-7. <laughs> and uh, it's it's a place where which is active, like I said, only on Sundays. So anyone can go there. You can speak about any topic. And um, it's it's, like I said, it's about freedom of speech. So you can speak about religion. You can speak about politics uh, or basically any topic that comes to your mind and uh, this is the beauty of this place so it's 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 also protected uh in in a way by the government in the sense that by legislation over there the people can speak freely without any hindrance and if somebody tries to i don't know go over the boundaries there are police officers there who can actually restrict you from doing that but as far as speaking is concerned they shouldn't be doing that and they don't usually unless it's like i said it goes over the boundaries now what i want to say is that because speaker's corner before the cameras came there uh so the the speech used to be kind of limited to that region only to that place uh to hyde park only but now alhamdulillah with the advent of uh social media and with more cameras and more uh, channels popping up, as you can, um, you, you probably might have noticed, this message has now reached global to such an extent that now you go to any corner of the world, people have heard uh, about Speaker's Corner, about the Dawah, about the Muslim. So the message of Islam, mashallah, has reached uh, all around the globe. I remember a uh, uh, once uh, Brother Hamza sources from the IRA, now Sapi he's at Sapiens Institute, he once said that he visited a really small town or a village uh, in Indonesia. And as soon as they found out that he's from London, the first question they asked him is, have you been to Speaker's Corner? <laughs> so Alhamdulillah, it's, it's become popular in that sense, but in a good way. So there is a, a platform for us which allows us to spread the message of Islam. So the, the positive messages can be spread from this platform. But uh, again, I mean, it, it, it's kind of a double-edged sword. So because it's become popular, there are other people who try to basically misuse this freedom of speech that has been given by the United Kingdom uh, in this place. And somehow they want to mi uh, misrepresent Islam. So we have lots of our enemies as well. Uh, at the park. And this is where the difference between doing a normal, uh, what do you say, street dawah or a dawah table or uh, even a lecture hall or some other place. So Speaker's Corner is one of those places where we have 
both Muslims and non-Muslims. And the non-Muslims who come there, they come with a, spe a specific agenda and a specific pur purpose, basically to malign Islam, to misrepresent Islam, to cause doubts to uh, basically uh, Muslims who might not have knowledge of their deen to that extent. So they, they basically kind of deceive them by misrepresenting Islam. And this is where we come in. So we try to turn the tables against them, to show them the correct message of Islam, to get rid of the doubts that people have, to get rid of these stereotypes people have. And the media, unfortunately, has formed about Islam. And it's a platform which we can use and utilize today uh, with the power of social media. So now, as most of you know, uh, we don't have just the mainstream media. We also have something called the social media, which is more or less in the hands of the public. So it is up to you brothers and sisters, if you want to utilize your time more productively, more effectively, you can help the Dawa. You're part of the ecosystem. Uh, so it's not just us speaking. It's not just Ustaz uh, Firdos or Kalim or Muhammad or Mansoor speaking for Dawa from that platforms. You also are a part of the, uh, the ecosystem. Your comments, your sharing of our links, your uh, participation whether it's just by typing or it's just by sharing. So even if you say without saying a single word, you can spread the da'wah and inshallah, you will see the ajr, you'll see the reward of this in the akhirah and inshallah even in the dunya. You know, this is something which the prophets, like I said, this is the legacy of the prophets. It's 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 a huge, what do you say, honor to be doing this. And as uh, Brother Firdo said, this is something which is obligatory for all of you. Now, just to clarify one point here. So when 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 people say that Dawah is fard on everyone, I think fard is divided into two. So there's fard al ain and fard al kafiyah. So the fard al ain is your personal obligation. For example, your salah. Nobody else can do the salah for you. For you to pay zakat, nobody else can pay zakat for you. Okay, so these are your personal obligations, which Allah will hold you accountable for. And there are other obligations which are communal. So, for example, if there is a janazah, if there is a funeral, all the Muslims of that town or that village don't need to go. If a, uh, if a let's say, small or sizable number um, basically fulfill that uh, obligation, then the whole... Uh, community's obligation is fulfilled. That's why it's Fard al kifaya which is your communal obligation. Similarly, Dawah is a communal obligation, I think specifically in a Muslim country. I think, I'm not going to give any fatwas, but in non-Muslim countries, there is many have said that this is now obligatory for everyone because we have, what do you say, minimum or we are the minority here. Yes, we are not the majority in a non-Muslim country like the UK. So make it a habit, make it a, what do you say, your, your lifelong endeavor to learn about your deen, to strengthen your your own, what do you say, uh, base first, yeah? So your foundation has to be strong. You can't just jump into da'wah and start giving da'wah when your own foundation, foundation is uh, so weak that some missionary comes and tells you a few, what do you say, surahs or ayahs, which um, according to them are contradictory, which really are not to a knowledgeable Muslim who can actually counter that quite easily. But someone who is a novice, they might say, oh, this is a contradiction. Now I'm getting doubts in my deen. So please, brothers and sisters, strengthen your own iman first. Strengthen your foundation. Learn your deen. Learn the basics, yeah? And inshallah, then give dawah. So it's 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 a noble cause, but it's a responsibility for everyone with something which is, uh, you have to do it effectively, productively, rather than having a negative impact on your own self, inshallah. Brother Muslim, right, if you want to add something. Much yeah. Uh, is my audio any clearer or not? That's yeah. perfect, actually. Hold which on. means I have a question for you now, uh, yeah. which is, are you deliberately combative? Is this your normal nature when we see you shouting at Speaker's Corner? Or is it is it some, is it because... Uh, what, what, what is that, Brother Mansoor? What, why do we see this typically always in the videos? Excellent question. Um, okay, so let's, let's understand, first of all, the dynamics that goes on in Speaker's Corner. So Speaker's Corner, as you now have understood, or if you've already seen and, and understood it already, it's a platform where you can express any views, whether you are for, or against, neutral, whatever it might be. You can express your views vocally um, with, with force and in power and in intent. And no one really is going to really be offended because it's a free speech corner. So what happens is over the years, as... Initially, it was a political platform where the political opposing political parties will come and, you know, get it off their chest 
talk against the government and their policies and so on. But this has moved on because people have been using for a long time um, for calling people religiously as well in terms of calling people to God and so on. So as it becomes a religious corner in terms of religious speech engagement or engagement in this kind of interactions, a lot of people will come with the intent to speak of religion to other people and engage in a discussion like that. Obviously, naturally speaking, some people are receptive and some people are very antagonistic. Some people are very opposing to religion. I mean, if you now look at the models across the globe where you know anti-religious sentiment is so strong, where they don't want just, you know, I'm neutral religion, they're against religion in a forcible way. So this kind of antagonism has been there for a long time. So if you speak about God, if you speak about, you know, you know following a particular religious uh, code of life, there will be severe antagonism. So what's happened is people, as they're engaging in this platform, they will be really you know, argumentative. They will try on the best to refute you, debunk you, and go against your views. And often it becomes like an emotional thing as well. I mean, it's wise that it is always intellectual and rational, but it's not always the case. Because oftentimes what happens is people that come there to discuss. They come from an emotional perspective. They come here to actually say, I don't like Islam or I don't like this because you know you are all this and that. Okay. So coming from an emotional perspective and they will then engage with you on a very harsh tone. Now you have a few approach to take. You can very softly and gently, you know, neutralize them and engage with them. Oftentimes it's not possible. You have to be really harsh and defend and clarify those misconceptions. And this is, becomes a very combative, and this is some of the uh, brothers are explaining in the, in the, in the comment section, it becomes like a competitive model, co combative, where you're actually saying, no, it's not true. This is what it is. And because of the emotional dynamic that goes on there, you're not really in front of a computer, you know, on, on your keyboard, you're a live person who is insulting you and mocking you and ridiculing you, unless you have a very thick skin, it's very difficult not to be emotionally moved. And you will be within this dynamics, acting and interacting. Of course, we try our best to always be patient, but often you will see our voices can be raised. I mean, for two reasons. One, we want everyone to hear us because of this noise all around. Speaker's Corner is very noisy. It's noisy all around. You can't hear the next conversation that happens, you know, just a uh, few hands apart, uh, you know, you know, few feet apart. Very noisy, like a fish market often. So you need to raise your voice and you need to raise your voice also when the cameras were coming so they can, they can hear because not everyone had microphones then. Now you can have microphone clipped all over you like a necklace. So often you probably have seen them, uh, Brother Abbas with a necklace all over his neck, right? Um, so that's one way we have to raise our voice so that our opponent or our interlocutor who is speaking can hear us, as well as the audience who can hear us. And the other, other times the voice is raised is unintentional, where you know, you're at a heat of a discussion, your voice is raised. And this is what everyone's trying their best to, to keep their tone down. Um, otherwise, it looks like a very confrontational discussion and no one listens to you anyway. So... When we see this dynamic goes on and you are actually immersed within it, you might not often realize that you're speaking very loud. Are you speaking in, in a way, in a tone that people think you are arguing in a harshly? But it's not the intent. It's just the context of the environment that makes you speak like that. Of course, if you watch our videos a few years back to now today, um, we hope that our tone has been toned down. Uh, you know, we, we are more of now of a reasonable voice and content um, in the way we're discussing, because that's what we want to push forward as a view. You know, we're learning ourselves every every week as we, as we go there. And we want to also put push forward this view where, you know, you cannot use a harsher model. And if you do, look what happens. I mean, you know, from the Quran, you know, Muhammad Islam was said, but if he, he was Ghalid and Shadid, he was a very strong and then, you know, they're going to be receptive and listening. So we try our best and we always, one of the, you know, requests that we make for people, our brothers and sisters all right, to pray for our patients so that we are patient in kind of this kind of 
you know, insults and ridicule and mocking that is come coming our way, so that our emotion don't go, you know, give way because we want to represent Islam rather than our own self. People can, you know, insult me, whatever doesn't matter, you know, but what I want to present is what Islam is, what Islam has to say, and what is the Islamic particular position on this topic. So it doesn't matter if you've called me or my families, whatever, in, in, in that sense. So, you know, we have to make a differentiation between this. So this is why Speaker's Corner is often confrontational because people come prepared to attack you, to attack your position, to attack your religion, to attack the Quran, and specifically in the recent times, to attack the Prophet ﷺ, his character, his model, and so on. And that is a very, um, you know, a subject that everyone needs to understand that when we are defending the honor of our Prophet ﷺ, it's because of our love of our Prophet ﷺ, our zeal, our passion, because he is someone who should be loved beyond anyone else. And that's why we often may be, you know, um, behaving in a particular way, but that cannot be used, uh, this particular approach, anywhere else apart from this kind of uh, environment. So in, in the discussion with them, we often hear the term of, uh, would you accept your position? Would you move away from this position? Do you um, take this statement back? Is there some kind of argumentation model that you're following or or is it required as part of being a speaker corner that you have to sort of present a position and then you argue them down, accept it, move on, or you don't move off a point until they've conceded the point, for example? Because I hear that quite often in your discussion. So is that is that part of the model or is that just something you do? Sure. Uh, excellent question. And we're going to make this question broad for our uh, Malaysian mm. counterpart, inshallah, so that we can understand the different models that we are using in the Dawa processes, which model specifically works in which context and which one would not. And I will let the brothers uh, explain in terms of what particular model they're following and what should be an ideal model, which is the core model that needs to be followed in any context. Because you can have contextual differences wherever you are and who you're speaking with or speaking to, but there has to be some core elements that you need to cover uh, when you are speaking and engaging with people. Because ultimately, we lost you again, brother. Ultimately, is it better now? Ultimately, yes. ultimately, you're calling people to Islam, so it has to be the core elements that needs to be addressed. So, just very briefly, even though it might seem ad hoc. But over the years, because of our experience, we have amalgamated various models that we use and utilize within our, our activities in Speaker's Corner. And that amounts from the core, the essential, as well as what is needed for the particular individual. So the particular model that I follow, apart from the core model that needs to be uh, followed, um, this is something that we can explain later, is one of a patient doctor type interaction model. So I want to know the person I'm speaking to, what exactly is their issue, their you know agenda, their problems they might be having, or what are their difficulties uh, they're facing in terms of not accepting Islam, for example. So one is understanding that and then giving what is required for that particular individual, the amount of information and the type of information they need. So if someone has no problem in accepting the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, no pro problem in accepting, ac accepting the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but the only issue they have is certain concepts, the moral concepts or ethical concepts of Islam, like, you know, why in Islam you have this and that, then there's no point in discussing about the existence of Allah and its oneness and so on, because the person is already accepting that. So you only focus on those points or issues that is most pressing for that individual and you address that. And this is how then you feel that, okay, fine. If someone comes with a pain in their in their hand, you don't want to discuss about the problems they have with the kidneys because they don't have any problems with the kidneys. You will focus on that. particular. So this is how the patient-doctor interaction model works. So what we do use, um, inshallah, we'll open up to uh, uh, Brother Ferdows and Kaleem, is whenever we speak to people, you have to have this background in mind. What are you calling to? What are the things you're going to call to? What way are you going to call to? Are you going to talk about a few things that they need to know before you depart because they will never have the chance again maybe speaking to you anymore? 
that they have taken the essential information from you that if even if they they didn't speak to any other muslim but at least it gives them the impetus the 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 spark to go and inquire further or themselves to start rethink about their belief and and inquire about what we said so these are the things that is that something that they have to you know we have to cover are we going to cover a model like GoRap or Dawa Funnel, which uh, inshallah we will um, highlight uh, a little bit more on. And what exactly are the key steps that we're going to use? Are we going to start initially, you know, talking about like, you know, look, look, what, I'll give you an example. When people knock on my door, well, they used to a few years, you know, decades ago, they used to call Jehovah's Witnesses. I'm not sure you're familiar with them. Jehovah's Witnesses, they'd come in the door knowing, you know that they know, knowing that you're a Muslim, they'll come and say, you know what, look at the problems that are all around the world. And um, what we could... this is, they want to talk about like some problems in the world. And then somehow, eventually, like they want to give you some literature. Are we going to do, you know, conduct ourselves with this model or directly say, why you're not a Muslim? Is this a good approach to say? So all of this, I would say, depends on your knowledge of different models, knowledge of that particular individual who's coming to speak to you, and then engage in that in that individual context. That is the best approach in my view, because it's no point specifically talking. Oh, let me let me tell you about why in Islam we have you know the inheritance differences between a son and a daughter, I mean, because you've read about it and you want to really share this information. They don't really care about inheritance, whether they get half or full or two thirds or whatever. So it's not going to work. So, so let us now. I mean, this this is my perspective. Mm -hmm. It is a amalgamation of different models and approaches because no single model, I think, is applicable in Speakers Corner because you have people from all over uh, the world coming here as uh, visitors and as well as missionaries, atheists, agnostics you know, Hindus and so on. So you have to use contextualized models, which works and is best fit. So brother, um, for those, if I may bring you into this, tell us about the background, first of all, of, um, you know, Vakir Ilmu, that initially was an initiative, and your background, what exactly the models you're taking and why the models you're taking is suited best um, for the environment that you are in and how can you use some of the models that we are engaged in using in Speakers Corner to somehow make uh, um, some use of it so that people don't really waste their time fully absorbing the model from Speakers Corner and thereby not really creating havoc and problems in your context. Because if they did, then they won't, no one probably listen to you because our model is very confrontational, uh, as I explained earlier on. Tafadda. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, when we talk about uh, what type of model that we are using and uh, in this part, in this uh, side of the world, and then so why we are using it, and um, well, uh, when we when we talk about it, I I'm very much agree. I think uh, nothing much that I disagree with you. I think hundred percent that uh, you say about the approach, because a lot of people they misunderstood the concept of dawah in which they thought that no. That one is about you know when they, they always quote that uh Udu illa sabili robika bil hikma surah anaha was was one two five invite people with the in the way of your lot with wisdom for them wisdom is gentleness in which I agree in which I agree the default is gentleness I I, I believe that uh, no Muslim will disagree with that inshallah okay but but the the, the problem is we away judge the other side of the world, or maybe our neighbors, the way how they conduct their da'wah. And when they are different with us, we always think that, oh, they are wrong. No, they are so harsh. Oh, this is too soft. Oh, this is they're selling out their soul. Oh, no, no, this, these people, I mean, uh, they, are, they are very harsh. They, they are not supposed to even speak about Islam. They do not fit to represent Islam. But then when we look into this, let's, let's talk about um, the giant in da'wah. We, I mean, we are not giant. We are very miniature by <laughs> by size and by status as well. Let's talk about Sheikh Ahmad Didat. A lot of people will look at look at him that oh you know, the way he talked to other people during his debate. I mean people would thought that oh he's so harsh. He will drive people away. 
But then when you understand where he's coming from, what make him to behave at such in, in such a manner, then you will start to understand that his method is effective. Likewise, Islam, just like in Dawah, Islam is, is very dynamic. There is no one way or there is, this is my only way and this is the only way. Anybody who differ with me, okay, they are out of the fall of Islam. Their way is wrong. We are not. This is not the way. So when we talk about the way in uh, Speaker Corner and uh, versus us in Malaysia, do we really argue with people? Yes, occasionally. Yes, occasionally. I, and I believe that uh, most of the video that was uploaded in, uh, in, in your guys' channel uh, are those that, you know, very confrontational, okay? In which they confront you guys, in which people generally just look at what is, a, is the conversation is all about. They do not understand where this person, where this particular, coming, this particular person coming from, how he approached you guys. Those things are not being shown. So the moment they saw this, they watched this, they would think, ah, oh, it's so Mansur. Hashim, they are very harsh. Not supposed to be like that. Now, so when we talk about... Actually, the brother, approach, brother, brother, that's actually a very powerful point, uh, which is before you see what's actually on video, you have to remember there's a backstory of other things that will have happened. That le Because remember, when you ask somebody, can I video you? There, and you got to remember that the, the human dynamic here, there is a need to set the camera up. There is a need to stand in front of the camera, which means there will have been a pre-discussion that will have happened or some situation would have been would have gone through. So we start from halfway or, or at least partway into that interaction. And then you have to remember as well that the camera eye is your eye, but behind this camera, there is a field of people. I mean, yes. it is, I mean, and so you got to imagine as well that, uh, as Brother Mansur said earlier, you're, you're not only educating the individual that is in front of you, who could be quite confrontational, quite adversarial, but you're also educating this crowd of people that is surrounding you. Yes. And, and, and but Muhammad, if you, if you look into this now, without mentioning anyone in particular, will you invite someone to become Muslim by grabbing their they are close this way. Will you do so? Never, never, never. We will never. say, oh, no, no, no. That person, he didn't know what is da'wah is all about. How can you invite people doing da'wah, grabbing his shirt like this? Now, brother and sister, if we are saying no, now are we saying the approach of Prophet Sallallahu when Umar ibn Qatar radiallahu an went to the house of Al-Arkam in Abi Arkam before he became Muslim is wrong? Because the moment Umar ibn Qatar radiallahu an he came in and Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam grabbed his shirt and asked him, Oh Umar, when you gonna stop? And Prophet Sallallahu is grabbing his shirt. So are we saying the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam approach is wrong? No. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam know very well who is Umar and how to approach him in that manner. Now, if you think it's very easy, that's why uh, often it's very important for us as a Muslim not to judge other people from the other side of the world or maybe our neighbors just by looking at the clips of five minutes 10 minutes 15 minutes because we don't really understand and we don't even know what is what happened before that it is it's something that we have to understand inside every text there is always a context and it is not wise even for us as a muslim to go to google or go to youtube search for any particular fake ruling in which the sheikh who might be answering that particular question is referring to the conditions of that particular person who asked. Yeah. It might not be applicable to you during that moment. Yeah. So likewise, in that one, which approach are the best? My, uh, my answer to that is, no, any approach, any approach that doesn't contradict the Quran and Sunnah is applicable. There is a time and place. There is a time where you have to become firm. There is a time that you have to become gentle. There is a time you have to become silent. There is a time for every single thing. But a way we have to understand hikmah is not merely about softness. It's not merely about gentleness. Okay? But hikmah is about the right approach, the right words to the right person at the right situations with the right amount, knowing what is the priority during the particular time. Like Brother Manso said, that, well, if you have a pain, 
on his hand, you are the doctor, you don't ask about gastric, you don't ask about liver, you don't ask about any other part. Just deal with that particular things. But then, when we look into the Quran and Sunnah, we will understand the dynamic of da'wah of all the anbiya is quite different. And then, we have to ask ourselves, why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala narrate to us the story of the previous prophet? Why? When Allah is telling us about their different style of approach. Now, it's something for us to learn. And then to answer Brother Mansour's questions about what are the approach that we use here uh, in, in Malaysia in particular. Now, I, I would not represent Malaysia in general, okay? Uh, if not, then people might say, oh, who appoint you to represent Malaysia? <laughs> okay, let's talk about the, uh, the organization itself. Now, my background, I'm a salesperson. I'm a salesperson. And uh, I think, alhamdulillah, Allah blessed me with a bit of talent and passion for selling. So people might thought in the comment section, ah, now Brother Fidos is selling his beans. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, not at all. Okay. But what I'm looking at is that from a salesman perspective, what is my objective? My objective is to get the sales. Now, I'm not saying that, that we must get someone to convert or become a Muslim. No, not at all. But I think whenever we are doing that work, we have the higher objective, hoping the prospect that we are talking to, inshallah, we hope that Allah will guide them through us. That is our ultimate objective. And that is the happiest thing that we want to achieve. But then when I look into the model as a salesman, the first and foremost is that I need to build trust. I need to tell the customer, the prospect, why they need to but listen to me first. Meaning, I have to build the trust. Just like Prophet Sallallahu I always model myself and model our way of da'wah and looking into the sirah of Prophet Sallallahu For example, during the first few years of da'wah, Prophet Sallallahu he went up to the hill of Safa and he called upon all the Kabila one by one and he was known as Al-Amin and everybody know. He was known as Al-Amin, but yet he did not take that for granted. But yet, when everybody, everyone, every Kabila with their representatives is over there, he asked all oh, people, if I were to tell you now, there is a group of army behind this hill that will attack us, will you believe me? Now, what he's trying to do here, we, we have to understand this, brother and sister, that we are talking about this person, this man, Muhammad sallallahu alaihi is a person that have the accreditations which has been known as Al Amin, the trustworthy one. But yet he do not took that as uh, just take it by uh, uh, like people say, you know, for granted. He asked that, and then when every single one said, "Yeah, Muhammad, if you were to say so, we will trust you. We never see you lying." Then only Prophet sallam he conveyed the message. So now, listen, I am Muhammad, the messenger. Okay? And then he go on and inviting them to, to become Muslim. Now, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is establishing the trust. Like us in da'wah, the issue is the trust. Now, can they trust us? They might say, oh, yeah, 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 you can say whatever you want, but you Muslim are liar. Now, if they already have the perception that we are liar, the issue is, for us, it's about to neutralize. For us, we don't buy certain brand in our life. A dough is very, wow, the price is good. The, the, the design is nice. But we don't buy it. Why? Because we have a certain perception over that brand itself. Now, until they neutralize the way how we think, the perception they have, the trust that we have upon that, whatever marketing they're going to do, whatever sales talk they're going to do to us, it, they will never be able to sell us anything. So for us, it's about selling to build it the trust. Once we have built the trust, the credibility, the integrity, then we have a conversation. It's about navigating. And for us, we have this the principle in which generally people do not change their decisions. People do not uh, make wrong decisions generally. I give you some example in order for us to understand clearly. I'm not saying this is something nice, this is something good, but just 
as an example, a clear example. Now, when someone who are in poverty, they have no food to eat for a few days, their children don't have food for, to eat uh, for a few days. Now, when they decide to rob, a, let's say, a convenience store, now, are they making the right decision during that time? Yes or no? I'm not saying their action is correct, but I'm saying that when they make that decision to rob the uh, any shop, is that the are they making a right decision during that time or wrong decision? It's out of survival. It's, 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 a, uh, it's a survival decision. Now, for that reason, survival decision, I know this is this action is not correct. It's illegal, it's a crime, but this is the best decision that I can come up with whatever information or resources that I have in order to keep my family afloat and I have to give them food. And I know the risk involved in making this decision. Now, if you give him a different chance, like by saying, okay, before you go and rob, now, I'm going to give you this amount for money, but you have to work 12 hours or 18 hours per day. Now, do you think he will go and rob? No, obviously it's not. It's logical. Likewise, why someone is a non-Muslim, or in our context, we call them as not yet Muslim. Why? They are non-Muslim, and yet we are today as a Muslim. And when people ask me uh, why you became Muslim, I told them that question is no longer relevant today. The question that you should ask me today as a Chinese reward in Malaysia is that why I remain as a Muslim today mm -hmm. after 17 years. It's not about why I became Muslim. Okay, the reason why I stay as a Muslim today are far important compared to the reason why I became Muslim. Last time I became Muslim, maybe because of one, two reasons, but with the onslaught, with the attack on Islam, day in, day out, every part of the world. Now, let's be very honest. Is it easier to retain our identity as a Muslim, practice as a Muslim, or to live Islam and live your, the life that you like and nobody going to stereotype you? The latter is much easier. But the reason why we stay as a Muslim is far more important. So likewise, having said so, okay, so having said so, uh, that is the part that we have the point that people will make new decisions based on the new information that they receive. So our job, our module here, is that to present them with more information about Islam, and that's why we have these three that we make it as our uh, target. Number one, when we talk to people, is a prophetic method as well. Number one, the reason why they remain as a non-Muslim because they might have, and definitely they will have, misunderstanding towards Islam. So now, our first goal is to reduce their misunderstanding towards Islam. Reduce it. Now, and then... We have to increase, okay? We have to increase their information, their knowledge about Islam. This is number two. And number three is that we will make them and we have to make them uncomfortable with whatever uh, munkar or shirik or kufur they are involved in. Like Brother Hashim mentioned, okay? To plant the seed of doubt. Because until then, you don't have any conversation. Until then, they were, okay, okay, okay. I have misunderstanding about Islam. But the misunderstanding reduced, but they don't get enough information, which is enough reason. For us, information is equal to reason to become a Muslim. Why I have to leave my current religion in which I'm comfortable with? Now, again, the term comfortable can be very misleading because somebody can get drowned because they get too comfortable in a two feet water. They get too comfortable. They can still drown too. So comfortable is not something good. And for us as a da'i, I'm sorry to say, I have to make the prospect that we are talking to to feel uncomfortable with their situation today and they have to change. And they have to change. And of this course, actually, we follow a certain So Brother Philip, this actually brings two things to mind for me. I think the first one is this question of what is their world view that makes them so comfortable? You need to understand that. And, and then there's a series of questions that are required to achieve it. What is it you believe? Why do you believe this? Dig into this. 
But then there's a flip side, and we see this quite often online, and especially on the one-to-one -one hour that we do here locally, which is this, it is manifested as arrogance, but it's actually, there's a particular term for it, and it's called a Dunning-Kruger complex, right? And it is that mo most people who have this sort of arrogance actually are unaware of how ignorant they are of the real facts of any given situation. And, and if I, I mean, if, if you don't mind, I'll take a couple of seconds to just relay a very quick story here that this is built around. So Dunning and Kruger are a couple of research scientists, uh, psychologists, and they came across an interesting case in, in, in America of a bank robber who robbed a bank with no mask and actually laughed at the cameras as he left doing his crime. Of course, the police arrested this, this guy and he was completely, I mean, he was completely, first of all, aghast and surprised that the police even recognized who he was. And secondly, he was amazed that he was arrested. And and I'll cut the long story short, but he sat in the police station uh, repeatedly just saying, but I used the juice. But I used the juice. I don't understand what happened. So anyway, uh, Dunning and Kruger, the two sides, they sort of, and he genuinely, I mean, this, this, he wasn't making this up, he was genuinely confused. They got to behind so they interviewed this guy and say, what did you think was happening? He says, well, I was taught that lemon juice can be used to create invisible ink. Makes writing invisible. So I actually put lemon juice all over my face. My face should have been invisible. <laughs> okay? So I don't understand. And he actually said the police doctored the cameras with his phone. He said, my face is invisible because lemon juice makes things invisible. And, and that's when the Dunning-Kruger sort of theory or the complex was created, was that, which they said is there are some people who have such low level of information and they have such a low level of understanding of how facts fit together that they genuinely will not believe anything you tell them. And you need to recognize this. This is not arrogance in this case. This is actually genuine ignorance. Yeah. And it manifests it sometimes itself as overconfidence because nobody has ever actually disagreed with them. Nobody has actually put them into this uncomfortable situation to question why they believe what they believe. Okay, and, and, and so what you will find is when you take people down to the issue of, okay, why do you believe what you believe? Something they've never really looked into. That's when typically you will get one response. The one that I get is, you know, I'm busy right now. I need to go. This is the usual response I get. I'm really, you know, they've been talking to you for like 30 minutes, but you bring this situation is all of a sudden they get very busy and they need to go. And you say, please, can you, what, I just need one more minute of your time. And it's like they don't have any more time. Brother Khalil, you're laughing. You'll clearly come across this, right? Um, so I just, want to make, I just want to mention this, that we see this quite often over here. Do you come across this kind of situation in, in, your, in your sort of street um, um, interactions as well? Yeah, Kalim Bai, you've been quiet. I think you should uh, yes, Kalim Bai. tell us what came to your mind. <laughs> Share with us. Other than the biryani, I'm still thinking about that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I've been enjoying listening to all of you, alhamdulillah. You know, uh, as a talib of ilm, as a student of knowledge, you know, every uh, gathering that which we are in, either uh, you benefit others with your knowledge or you benefit yourself. That's a policy that which I believe in, alhamdulillah. So I'm getting benefit, alhamdulillah, from all the discussion that which is happening. Uh, just to uh, bring back... Uh, on the same uh, idea about different contexts, different places, especially the speaker's corner that which was discussed for a, quite a long time, mashallah, uh, you know, and we've been mashallah also working on those videos, like we see confrontational approach in the speaker's corner. Uh, I remember uh, one of the uh, great visionaries of Islam, uh, Dr. Israr Ahmad. Uh, for those of you who come from the Indian subcontinent, must be aware of this giant in Dawa, in the field of Dawa, mashallah. Now he's no more with us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on his soul. 
when the same verse that which Brother Firdo spoke about, Surah Nahal, chapter 16, verse number 125, wherein Allah says, Udru ila sabili rabbika bil hikmah wal mawizatil hasana wa jadilhum billati hiya ahsan. So Dr. Isar Ahmad, while doing the famous tafsir, which recordings are also available on YouTube of the Quran, he says, this is in a way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala educating us that there are primarily three categories of people whom you will come across when you are doing dawah. The first is the intellectual or the academia who will have arguments, who will have studied your scriptures, who will have done the research, you know, they are, and they are most likely to, you know, hear only intellectual arguments. They are not from among the laymen. They are from among the elite. So for such people, Allah wa ta'ala uses the argument that you have to use hikmah. And hikmah, if you uh, read the tafsir from various tafsir, it refers to using the Quran and the sunnah in general. Using the Quranic arguments, using the seerah of the Prophet wasallam, the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam, how to handle such academia. And I believe in that part of the world, mashallah, uh, in UK, we are aware that there is an institute by the name Sapiens Institute. I believe uh, this institute has been established to cater to this crowd, the academia and the people who are coming up with their research against Islam and the arguments against Islam. The second, which Dr. Isar Ahmad says, is Walmu'izatil Hasana, to call people towards the way of Allah with good exhortation, with good speech, with good, uh, you know, wazo nasihat, we say, you know, uh, and sincere advice and calling them towards the simplicity, the simple uh, understanding of Tawheed in Islam. The simplicity of accountability to our actions, which is so clear. The day of judgment, which is a logical consequence to the life that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to us to fulfill the purpose. And majority, according to Dr. Isar Ahmad's analysis and his experience, belongs to this category. And I believe for this, mashallah, we have to educate the masses in general, the Muslim ummah, give them the simple tools uh, like, you know, uh, yes, there are fiqh issues that dawah is fardh kifaya or fardu ayn, uh, fard, fard ayn, that is individual obligation or communal obligation. But I, uh, mashallah, after having listened to many of the ulama, uh, I'm of the opinion that Surah Al-Asr, chapter number 103, verse number 1 to 3, wherein Allah tabarak wa ta'ala addresses the entire humanity, wal-asr, by the token of time, inna al-insana lafi khusr, all of humankind is in loss. That all people are in loss amongst the entire humankind, except for those who have faith, do righteous deeds, and call people towards the haq. So dawah is one of the duties if you want to be safe from being amongst those people who are lost. So we have to train the general masses of the Muslims, the two billion and more Muslims that which we have, to do dawah based on their abilities based on their capacities. Yes, we do agree that they should have their foundational knowledge correct. As Allah correctly pointed to in Surah Yusuf, chapter 12, verse number 108, Allah wa tells to the Prophet Sallallahu Say, I call people towards the way of Allah on Basira. Ana wa man I and as well as those who follow me. So that Basira, that strong foundation of knowledge, which is Tawheed, Risala, and which Brother Firdos will, inshallah, you know, deal with it more when he talks about the funnel of Dawah, like how we have to stepwise bring them to it. And this is, my dear brothers and sisters, easy to learn, easy to implement. And lastly, the third category, he says, is Wajadilhum billati hiya ahsan. And there are certain people whose only job who's only bread and butter, and I believe so, Speaker's Corner has a lot of such people coming in, just to attack Islam. That's the bread and butter. They have been paid for it. There are organizations who are backing them. For such people, you have to even argue. You have to maybe sometimes even raise your voice to make yourself heard. And that's, you know, mashallah has been so well done by Brother Hashim and Brother Mansoor and the other brothers in Speaker's Corner. So Alhamdulillah, this third category of people are there to create sharp because they don't want to, you know, get out of the status quo. 
The status quo that which they want to establish is they want to remain in Batil and they want to take away from the Batil. Take people to the Batil, sorry, not away from the Batil. Take people towards the Batil and away from the Haq. So three categories of people and mashallah, and I know that it might overlap. It's not that, you know, you have to distinguish uh, people into only these categories. The overlapping is still there. But mashallah, this is something needed on all three fronts. We need people who are doing their research in academia and coming up with their works, you know, which can appeal to the elite masses, you know, like uh, to give you some examples, like, you know, in the present day world, we have the Richard Dawkins, we have Sam Harris and other guys, you know, who are coming up with these arguments, intellectual. So we have to deal with that. And Mawazid al Hassana is common for all. And this is where we as dais, as organizations, we have to educate people, build models, Models that which can be easily understood, contextualized, based on the countries that which you come from, based on the cultures that which you come from, so that everyone gets involved in their own way in doing dawah. And lastly, we also need people, alhamdulillah, to confront those people who are there only to cause shar. And I believe uh, this is uh, what I could say about what was discussed earlier, alhamdulillah. And I leave it at that. Jazakumullah khair. Barakallah fi, barakallah fi. I want to bring um, Brother Ferdius, um back to what we discussed about the models, just to summarize uh, your final thoughts on how, because you talked about how we were, we have to decrease the misinformation, increase the amount of information, and, and sort of make their whatever stands they're in, their position uncomfortable. So along with this line, um, you know, this particular model, please do elaborate a bit more. And we've already touched upon some of the uh, essential qualities of adai, or adai have to do, as well as the role of education. So if you don't mind, just after finishing, uh, finalizing different models and the best approach that you know it works according to your context, what sort of educational activities are you uh, and your organization involved? And that can be somehow you know, used contextually elsewhere so that we can use that as a global um, implementation, inshallah, because education is key. As you mentioned about, you know, making them, uh, you know, more informed, this is not only for the non-Muslims or yet to be Muslims, but also important for our, ourselves as Muslims too. So go ahead, brother. Well, sure. Now, um, just now I did mention about uh, decreasing their misinformations, misunderstanding about Islam. Number two is to increase their knowledge about Islam. And number three is to plant the seed of doubt, okay, to make them uncomfortable in their positions, their current position. Now, this is not in particular order, okay? Although I mentioned one, two, three, but it's not in particular order. Again, it depends on the audience itself, on the prospect itself. If you need to disengage them, to neutralize them from the beginning, then you do it. If not, then you have to do a lot of listening. We have a particular model where we will focus a lot on the soft skill itself. And this is where we will overlap with uh, the education part. Because one of the ways to empower our dying, we talk about dying, because like uh, what Brother Hashim mentioned uh, clearly just now in the beginning, in which for us to go into da'wah, yes, generally, the people around us, they are just a layman. But then, occasionally, we might be confronted by missionary, by people who have knowledge. I mean, uh, they do research and they put their soul and effort and their time and their money just to ridicule Islam and disseminate the misinformations about Islam because they are being paid. Okay, and you can see a lot on, 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 on YouTube. And I think we have a discussion about there are certain people, is I mean, Islamophobe, okay, Islamophobe, in which the moment YouTube demonetized, didn't allow them to monetize on their channel, they no longer produce video. Now you can see what is their true intention. For us, I mean, for in MRM and I think in Dawah Wise, regardless of there is a monetization or not, we are continuing our Dawah because the sole purpose is not about that. It's not about making money from our YouTube channel, from our, uh, you know, uh, Facebook channel. Now, this is where I say, like, for example, I give you one example that uh, commonly we were met with, even in Malaysia, we have people leaving Islam, born Muslim leaving Islam. I think uh, you guys confronted with a lot of uh, uh, atheists as well uh, in Speaker Corner. And 
one of the way that we make them uncomfortable with their stand because when someone have already make a decision to remain as who they are or to leave where they come from, for example, they are born as a Muslim, but to leave Islam, now, when they already leave these, these positions to become an atheist, they are very staunch. They have a very strong principle. For them, Islam is definitely wrong. Islam is cruel. Islam is not right. Islam do not belong to this world. This is their mindset. And of course, this mindset, it, do, it does not develop just on one day. Just as they say, there is a saying, Rome was not built in a day. Likewise, that mindset, that principle, was not built in one day. So now, for example, to plant the seed, to make that uncomfortable, is that, for example, we will come to it where they will always quote about science. Okay, this scientist say, that scientist say, I will not quote do it, I will not quote them because for me, uh, no need for me to popularize them. Although some some people might know them, some people might not, but I will not ready to mention their name. They those people who live Islam or people who are existing, they are atheists. They are, might be from other religion, Hinduism, Christianity, Buddhism, and become atheists. They will quote, oh, atheists say this, atheists say that. Okay, this scientist say this, this scientist say that, that expert say that. Well, we can go into a very deep argument about that. There is no issue at all. But the thing is that for we have a principle of kiss. Keep it short and simple. Keep it short and simple. Because with every position, you have another position. The issue is not about why. The issue is not about the positions that you took. No. It's not about that. The issue is that what is your, again, the yardstick. What is your yardstick to decide to choose these positions over these positions? It's not about the decision itself. It's about the yardstick that lead to the decision itself. Example, oh, you know, this group of scientists, you know, credible scientists, they say this. And because they are scientists and they do not believe in the existence of God. Okay, fine. Okay, I hear you. I got you. Now, but now, I want to ask you. And this is normally how we turn the table. We just ask them nicely. We ask them, okay. Now, that is your right to choose this group of scientists. But I believe you will agree with me, okay, that there is this group of scientists who do not believe in the existence of God, but yet... In the same time, there is another group of scientists who is as good or even better than this group of scientists who reject the existence of God. But this group of scientists, they believe and accept in the existence of God. My question to you is that, it's very simple. What is your yardstick, again, yardstick, to choose this group over this group? What is your yardstick? Now, tell me, oh, the journal that they publish, you know, how many likes they have, how many followers they have. Now, if they put their yardstick over something which is easily to be debunked, then their foundation is not very strong. And then they, will, they themselves will be shaky. They themselves will not defend their stand anymore. They, and we can see throughout the conversations, they will no longer really talk about, you know, oh, the scientists. They will no longer quote that part of scientists. They won't. Because they know this is very shaky ground. Okay? So this is how normally uh, the da'wah approaches that we do. And about education. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Please continue. Okay. There's a lag. Uh, yes, there's a lag. Okay. Our focus is always about the mindset, the method, the formula. When you have the right formula of thinking, then you, the way you make decisions will be based on this formula. If you don't have... More internet issues, I guess. Mm. Brother Fidos, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Is okay. it lagging? It's okay now. It was, it was okay. lagging, yeah. 
This was lagging. You, you froze completely, yeah. <laughs> but now it's okay. You can see me clearly. Yeah, we can. we can hear you and see you. Yes. Unfreeze. Slight lag sometimes. Okay, great. It's about the way of thinking. Okay, the way of thinking. Now, for us, the way to educate, to empower, we have been to Africa, to Latin America. First and foremost is that the way of thinking. For example, if you want to do that one, if you want to do that one, now, who is the one who can give guidance? We have to differentiate that. So, because a lot of that in that I know of, they are very active, they are very knowledgeable, but then eventually they quit doing that one. And then when you probe and ask more, you will realize they used to be very active in that one, but then they give up doing that one because they think that. Ah, I've been doing that all for a few years. Nobody became Muslim. Now, this is the reason why they quit. And some people quit after getting married. I don't have time to do that one. Completely. They quit completely. Okay? Some people, they quit that one because they don't see the tangible benefit. Monetary. They don't see the reward. They don't see the award. They don't see the recognitions from their peers, from their friends, from around the world. Okay, some people, they, are, they do that one because of their intention is that I want to have more subscribers on my YouTube so I can become the most popular dying on YouTube. Okay, and then I can monetize from that. So now we have to fix that mindset first. That first and foremost, the one who can give guidance purely is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And your job is just فَذَكِرْ إِنَّمَا أَنْتَ مُزَّكِرْ لَسْتَ عَلَيْهِمْ بِمُسَيْتِرْ your job is just to give warning, to just to give reminders, and the rest is only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's it. Your part is what you do, what is humanly possible, and the rest is what divinely possible. We have to separate that. Okay? Humanly possible and divinely possible. Come on. We just, how can we prove the existence of sun to someone who keep on closing their eyes and refuse to open their eyes? What can we do? I think by watching your video in Speaker Corner, there is a... We've lost you there momentarily. Um... Still frozen. Anyway, let's hope um comes back. Brother Kaleem, while um, the Fridus comes back. So in terms of what we're discussing about the role of education, Mm -hmm. Why is it so important for us Muslim du'a, the one who's calling to Islam, education is important for us for themselves and to impart the education on others to increase the level of education and how, uh, what are the resources and means that we can achieve the education? Is it just watching speaker corner videos, you think you know it all, or are there other avenues and resources that we must use to learn and then impart the education? Alhamdulillah. Uh, this is a very important question and which was just, you know, made a mention by Brother Hashim as well about having the knowledge before we get into the field of Dawah. We all know, my dear brothers and sisters, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the very first revelation that which he revealed was not to pray Salah, was not about Zakah or anything else. The first word that which he revealed, as Allah mentions in Surah Iqra, chapter 96, verse number one, is Iqra bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq. Read, recite, and proclaim in the name of thy Lord who created you. So the first instruction itself was read. And we, unfortunately, as Muslim ummah as a whole, I'm not talking about every individual, but Muslim as a ummah as a whole, we are giving the same response that which the Prophet ﷺ gave in a different context. Ma'ana bikari. I'm not a learned man. We are just shying away. We're just, you know, walking away from our duty and responsibility. This ummah is supposed to be a nation of learning. This ummah is supposed to acquire knowledge, to read. So we all as da'is, as du'ats, we should make sure that every Muslim, when I say du'ats, every Muslim should be a da'i in his own way. We should make it a point that we read, we enhance our knowledge every single day, even if it be with one single ayah. Like, and as you said, what are the uh, sources for acquiring knowledge? We Muslims, we have no disagreement that the first and the most important source of knowledge for Muslims is the glorious Quran. 
the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We all know that mashallah, we recite the word of Allah. We are given 10 rewards for every one letter. But we forget that, that there is another very important right of the Quran that which we need to fulfill, which is to understand the Quran, to read it with understanding and to implement its teaching in our lives and also to preach it to others. This is something that which is demanded by the Quran itself. And I don't have to give so many references in the Quran, which tells us to uh, do tadakkur, which tells us to do tadabbur, like Surah Nisa chapter 4, verse number 82. Afala yatadabbarun al-Quran. Allah says, do they not ponder over the Quran? So the first source for any Muslim to acquire knowledge about Islam, to enhance his knowledge, whether it be for doing dawah or whether it be for leading your life as a practicing Muslim, is to start learning the uh, Quran, to not just recite it, not just to read it, but to understand its teachings. Secondly, I would say that basically Allah's Messenger وسلم, encouraged us in the hadith of Sunan Ibn Majah, hadith number 224. Talabul ilmi ala kulli Muslim. Seeking knowledge is compulsory upon every single Muslim. Now people may ask, what is the extent of knowledge that which we need to seek? What is the extent? So the scholars have defined that the extent of knowledge first and foremost is your aqidah. You have to know whom you're worshipping. You have to know what your purpose of life is. Why do you exist on this planet? What purpose are you supposed to fulfill? The aqidah part needs to be first dealt with. Secondly, is the obligations, the duties that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has enjoined upon you. And simultaneously, concurrently, the haram things that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has clearly forbidden you to remain away from that, you have to know what are the haram things. So this is the basic knowledge. And when it comes to aqidah, once you start learning it, then you are duty bound as a part of the Muslim ummah Based on the verse of the Quran in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 110, Allah tells us, Kuntum khayra ummatin ukhrijat limnas. Ta'muruna bil ma'roof wa tanhauna anil munkar wa tu'minuna billah. That you are the best of humankind raised for all mankind. You are the best of communities raised for mankind. You enjoy what is good and forbid what is evil and you believe in Allah. So as you learn, you have to make it a habit that you preach, you teach others. And the Prophet وسلم, gave the bare minimum in the hadith, that which we often quote and we know it is from Sahih Bukhari, volume number four, hadith number three, four, six, one. The Prophet said, Ballihu anni walaw ayah. Convey from me even if it be single ayah. If you know even a single ayah from the glorious Quran, what is the most least that which we can know is Surah Ikhlas, chapter number 112, verse number one. Ul huwa Allahu ahad. Say he's Allah one and only. There are so many people who do not consider or do not believe in God. And there are so many people who believe in multiplicity of gods. So at least start with, Qul huwa Allahu ahad. Say he's Allah one and only. Yes, definitely. There will be questions asked. Why should I believe in one God? Why should I not believe in more than one God? What is the concept? Then you may have to continue to pursue your knowledge because this knowledge is not something that which you're going to get overnight. Every single day, set a target. Gradually, slowly, but make sure that inshallah, you reach your goal, you reach your purpose of life is not just to educate yourself, but also to educate others about Islam. I believe Brother Fadus is back so he can you know, continue from where he left, inshallah. Yes, so <laughs> we've, uh, we've asked um, Brother Kalim to explain the role of education um, yeah. in context of dawah as well as, as an, for individual Muslims, what we need to have you know, ourselves to be equipped with that knowledge, knowledge of our aqidah, our belief system, why, we, who would we worship and how we should worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as well as the practical aspects of that knowledge of knowing what is permissible, what is hara, you know, halal and what is haram, and, and, and so on, as the basic elements that a Muslim needs to know by necessity. Uh, in, in, in Islamic principle, there is a principle called, this is something known by necessity. So we have to know this basically. And of course, when it comes to education in terms of da'wah, so the majal of da'wah where you have to know what it's involved. Like as you mentioned earlier on, if you are in the sales industry, you need to know what you're selling and who you're selling to and how you're going to convey this sales points to your buyer. So when you are conveying the message of Islam, you need to know exactly what Islam is. 
convey it to the people so that they understand it, make it in a way they can appreciate the value of it, so that they can then say, fine, I want it. So these are the practical knowledge base that is essential for any da'i when it comes to education. So on top of that, we would like to add some uh, further points, inshallah, and then we'll move into an, another important aspects when we come across in engaging um, with other faith communities is about the shubha, is about the doubt that they bring. So let's first uh, you know, finish some points if you want to add, inshallah, on, on the educational aspects of where and what we need to learn as a du'at. Yep, I think uh, what Kalim have covered just now uh, is uh, very much uh, what we have, uh, we empower our, our da'i to do so. Alhamdulillah. Uh, and, but on top of that, it's not merely about uh, the knowledge that you have, but also the soft skill that you have. How to present it in a way that is digestible. Okay? Digestible. Because different people, they have different digestion system. Their metabolism are different. And of course, different people, they react differently. So for us, the ability... Okay, to learn the soft skill. Because soft skill is not something that you can just learn by the book. Oh, yeah, okay, this is how it goes. Okay, well, yeah, right. No. There's a lot of things that you have to go on the ground and to be on practical. And I'm utilizing, and therefore, we are we, we came up with a model, a, base, uh, a street dawah model, basically, uh, in which I was proud to say so that, uh, alhamdulillah, our street dawah model has been made as a thesis, as a, as a thesis, uh, in, in a university in Malaysia and then alhamdulillah it has been made as uh, the official uh, da'wah system, straight da'wah system for one of the religious authority here in Malaysia, alhamdulillah because I think uh, I would like to believe as well, I, I stand to be corrected that uh, that might be first time in uh, first time where for a da'wah organization to come up with a system, a da'wah system particularly focusing on street da'wah, how to approach people, what type of madu or the prospect that you will meet, but how do you engage with them? How do you build conversation with them? How do you lead the conversation with them? And then next and next. And in that system is, as well, we, have, we are utilizing the marketing system too, which is IDAR. Attention, interest, desire, actions, and then retention. So how do we raise the attentions? How can we create the attention and then how can we create the interest for them to know more and then on top of the interest how can we throughout the conversations to increase their desire and to increase their desire and to take action what actions to embrace islam or maybe the last not to hate islam or maybe to learn more about Islam or even and eventually maybe inshallah Allah will guide them and become a Muslim in the future. And retention is where if they do not become Muslim, how do we follow up? If they become Muslim, how do we follow up with them? Boy, by following the principle of birds of the same feather flocks together. Right? So those soft skills is very important. It's very important because uh, everybody can claim they are salesmen. Everybody can claim they are selling something. But I think we have encountered people who have the official title of salesman, but then when you look at their sales skill or their information or their knowledge about their own product is lacking. The way how they talk to us, is, is, there's no common sense. It's only forcing us, pushing us to make decisions. They are not guiding us to make decisions. They are forcing us to make decisions. And eventually, we do not feel feel comfortable dealing with a particular person. We like the product, but I think throughout our life, inshallah, we are all consumer. Throughout our life, it happened to be that we like that particular product, but because we hate the salesman, and eventually we don't buy that product, and we buy from the, <laughs> from the opposite brand, and then we show it, or maybe accidentally or by plan, we just walk past by them, just to show them that I have bought your competitor product, just because we don't we don't love them, we don't like them, right? So those are the things that to teach them the soft skill, how to present it, how to present it, because if you have a good product, you have a good knowledge about that product, but you do not know how to package it, you do not know how to present it in a way that is digestible. I always give this example. 
can we finish the whole chicken? Well, yeah, why not? But can you just the entire bed and swallow it? You can't. You have to cut it into pieces. And then sometimes you have to, okay, drumstick will be for breakfast, chicken breast will be for lunch, and then the rest will be for dinner and supper. And then by then, it's easy for people to digest. And that is how to present it in such a nice way. Okay, and of course, I think just now there's one one question that I didn't answer, Brother Mansur, is about uh, the fakir ilmu. This is where we start to engage with one another, basically. I, I think uh, we have your 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 debate with uh, one of the white guys that have I think uh, on fakir ilmu we have seven point four million viewer. Masha'Allah. Okay, seven point four viewer. Mashallah. Okay, and the next most popular video on Fakir Emu is my video, <laughs> which is seven million. <laughs> okay, which uh, doing street dawah as well. I mean, generally, honestly speaking, not many people in Malaysia is aware that Fakir Emu belong to MRM. Yeah, Mashallah. They 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 didn't aware about that because we never do the branding and we never shout about it that oh Fakir Emu belong to MRM. No. Basically, we bought the channel, the entire channel when it has less than 10,000 subscribers. And then throughout the years, three, four years down the road, Alhamdulillah, now around 330 plus thousand subscribers, uh, millions of views and uh, millions of, I would say, Alhamdulillah, millions of minutes are being watched. And we translate and we put the subtitle with the permissions from our friends around the globe uh, to translate and put the subtitle of Bahasa Okay, in order for people to understand. Okay, and you can see that the comment over there. A lot of people are not aware about it because generally, we do not promote it. We do not promote it. Because the purpose is about promoting Islam. It's not promoting MRM. It's not promoting me. No, that's why you can see. There is not many videos of mine over there. I think Mansur and Hashim, you have more video over there <laughs> than me. Okay? No. I, think good, I think good deeds like that should be promoted. <laughs> it's it's a good deed, isn't it? You should always promote good deeds, uh, especially you know, like when people uh, you want to I don't know motivate someone to give uh, charity, to give zakat, to give any any, any form of sadaqah. You know, the more you talk about it, uh, it's good because it's it's rewarding for you and for them as well. So you shouldn't shy away uh, in promoting good deeds. You know, nowadays on WhatsApp and I don't know other social media platforms. People promote movies and promote some crazy TikTok videos or something. You know, why can't we promote the good deeds? So inshallah, you should promote Fakir Ilmu if you're not doing that. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's yours. Or why not? You know, inshallah. That's how we social media works, indeed. isn't it? We want it to be independent. <laughs> so uh, we, we, we generally just uh, do a lot of video and hire a lot of our videographer, our multimedia department. They are busy. They have their own KPI. How many videos they have to translate and uh, edit every week, okay, mm -hmm. in order to produce, uh, I mean, just speaker corner video and maybe some other interesting video as well. Other than uh, they have other tasks to do, okay. And I think uh, in our DAWA department and multimedia department, we have more than 20 hours full-time, fully paid professional mm -hmm. doing that job. Okay, it's not it's not something that people thought that okay, yeah, they are they're just doing for part time. No, no, no. We take that was seriously and we want the best. If like like what Brother Hashim mentioned, if people can promote movie, if people can spend thousands, millions, or billions just to drive people away from Islam and to worship Allah, why can't we spend thousands of ringgit, which might be if it's a six thousand ringgit, Malaysia might be equivalent to one thousand pounds. I mean, to engage and hire more staff, more professional, to edit video, to produce more quality content in order to attract and drive people to come back into Islam and to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we found satisfaction in it. Absolutely. It's not yeah, about, no, you're, you're it, absolutely right it's not about the popularities. Yes. Yeah. So it's not just the, um, the knowledge about your deen, about uh, like within interfaith dialogues about other faiths as well. The soft skills are important. The technical know-how is quite important as well because it's, again, it comes under presentation. So if you present your da'wah um, in a correct way, uh, so you understand 
how the algorithms work, you know, how to present your video. So it's not just presentation, a lot of work goes behind. So since we started our channel, we got to know all this, the amount of work that goes into uh, promoting the videos, promoting um, and making the videos, it's, it's, it's just tremendous. So we do most of our stuff uh, so far. Uh, so Alhamdulillah, I think this would be a, perhaps a good opportunity for us to reach out to the people watching, particularly in Malaysia and Indonesia, who are able to help us with our new channel, the Nusantara channel, which we have linked in the, uh, yeah, we have linked it in the, uh, in, um, in the chat, yeah, and also in the description of the video. So if there are any brothers or sisters out there who are able to help us with the subtitles to our Speakers Corner videos, which we have got on our main English channel, the Dawa Wash channel, uh, you're more than welcome to contact us. So please reach out to us by email, uh, which is dawawise at gmail.com. Um, and yeah, please do like, share and subscribe to this new channel. So just like we have uh, built up our English channel uh, from scratch, I think it was last December when we launched it and alhamdulillah is uh, nearly 35k subscribers now uh, barakallah feek jazakallah uh, khair to all the people who shared and helped us and of course we thank allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make this effort uh, uh, and a means for us to spread the dawah and may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept it from us and most importantly may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala purify our intentions uh, all of us who are involved in the dawah so as uh, brother firdos earlier mentioned the monetary gain is something that is should never be the objective. The objective is always to spread the da'wah fi sabilillah, to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because at the end of the day, you know, the first hadith um, in, in, in Bukhari is in al amal abidniya. So your intention counts the most. It doesn't matter what you do, how much you do, what effort you do. If your intention is bad, all that is waste. So you can give a million pounds in charity, but your intention was to show off, then yes, Allah will say, okay, you want it uh, showing off. Allah might give you that, uh, what do you say, your 15 seconds of fame or something uh, on television. But then for Akhirah, it's nothing. Your million pounds is wasted in a way. But if you do it with the correct intention, even a pound you give, yes, or whatever um, currency your, your country, so you give them uh, with the correct intention, Allah will give you manifold, yeah, something unimaginable to you in this dunya. So you'll see this benefits in the Akhirah, inshallah. So yeah, um, Nia is quite important. Uh, so one more point I want to add uh, based on what you said earlier, both Brother Kalim and Brother Firdos. Um, so mashallah, it, education is important. Your knowledge is important. And today, you know, we live in an age which is of information. Yeah, so we live in an information age. And I think in this information age, ignorance is a choice. Okay, so you don't have an excuse. You 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 don't have knowledge, and if you seek out, you know, if you have the intention to and the will, you know, like in English they say, "Where there's a will, there's a way." So if you seek out and to start to gather knowledge and make sure this knowledge you gather, because on internet you get all kinds of information, isn't it? The good and the bad uh, and the ugly sometimes as well. So what you need to do is you need to understand, ask your, um, what is it, the leaders of uh, faith in your community, that which are good sites I can go, which are good books I can read. So these are all sources of information, but make sure they're credible. They are something which is beneficial and not the wrong kind. So try to have, uh, what do you say, try to filter out the bad and the ugly from the good. Okay, and inshallah that will be beneficial. So, and, and the most important thing is when you're discussing in Dawa, yeah, uh, try to stay in your lane. Because if you try to respond to every question, that is impossible for anyone. I don't think anyone out there is someone who has knowledge in all things, unless Allah gave you that ability. And uh, I don't think anyone is out there. Remember the story of Musa alayhi salam. He thought he was knowledgeable. He knew everyone and nobody else was more knowledgeable. And then Allah shows him in Surah Al-Kahf that there are other people who, who might possess the knowledge that you don't possess. So yeah, this is the beauty of the nizam of Allah that he gives everyone uh, different, what do you say, different amount and different abilities of knowledge and the way you, you present yourself is also a part of Dawah. As one of the brothers who mentioned in the in, in the chat, uh, this is quite an important because there's a hadith in, in this is in, in the Mawatta of, uh, of Imam Ahmed where he says the Prophet has come to perfect your character. 
And this is the character. Sometimes, you know, like that is the first impression. The first impression counts in anything. It doesn't matter what you're doing, whether it's Deen or Dunya. If you are going to behave in a way which is not something that the other person values or even, what do you say, uh, it impresses them in, in, in a way which attracts them to you, you know, then they won't even bother coming to you or accepting anything from you. It will all just be a waste. So try to present yourself, inshallah. Obviously, we, we can't do it all the time, but try your best. I mean, this is something that we all should um, endure what to do as well. And like I said earlier, try to stay in your lane because many times at Speaker's Corner, what happens is there are many topics which come to me. Uh, the, the, uh, the, someone comes to me with a topic, say, for example, evolution. Now, this is a topic Brother Sabur, mashallah, is well versed in. So I would actually direct that person to Brother Sabur if he's there or somebody else like uh, Muhammad Ijab who might have more information and more knowledge than this in this particular topic. So I would direct them. So similarly, when somebody comes to you and you're unable to answer, you can always give the email of your friend or your sheikh or your, your colleague who is more knowledgeable. And this way you do not let them down by giving them misinformation because that can be counterproductive. You know, if you don't have the knowledge in that topic and you start speaking about it, the other person, when he finds out that you have just been waffling, you've just been talking gobbledygook, then they, they will get the wrong impression of Islam. Say, look, these guys are just making up things, you know. So all the whole dawah, basically, ecosystem suffers in that way. Because they see Muslims, they judge you based on your character, based on what you say. So uh, your character, your sincerity, your uh, also the way you, you come across and the way you speak, the way you behave, all this counts towards the dawah. And this is all part of the dawah system, inshallah. Brother Firdaus, yep. just want to bring you back. As we were talking about the roles of the Dai, we should be using soft skills. And specifically in your part of your world, soft skill is very essential. So what about, you know, within the soft skill, we are talking about voice and the tones and how we should show empathy. Do you want to touch upon those? So we, we cover this uh, in a way so people understand what we actually mean by soft skills. Okay, so basically, um, soft skill is all about something like, for example, uh, what Mansour had mentioned just now, okay, the tone, the facial expression, the choice of word. I think the most, uh, and I believe the most important part in the soft skill is the listening skill and the observation skill. This is something that you have to observe and you have to, it's not something that written in a textbook by itself. Sometimes textbook and the reality might be different. Okay. So listening skill. What do I mean by here? For someone to ask us a certain question in which in that one, this is what we normally will encounter where people will ask us question. Now, the soft skill is, it's not merely about listening the, to the question itself. But while listening, before the prospect finish it, you listen to understand, and yet inside you, you are trying to process why is he or she asking this question here. Number two, what is the possible uh, background of this question? Number three is about how important is, th is this question? Number four, and of course, we, we are in, in our uh, Dawa workshop as well. We are sharing with our participants as well about what we call as OBT, outcome-based thinking. Outcome-based thinking. In which before we even start a conversation with a prospect, I think uh, I, I have never encountered in, in uh, Speaker Corner. Hopefully, inshallah, one day I can pay you guys a visit and watch yeah. you guys live. <laughs> Watching you guys live, okay? I'm not participating yet. We will see how. You so, are watching us live, know, by the way. <laughs> in high, in, in high park, inshallah. Yeah, inshallah. So, what is in the OBT is, number one, before you even start the conversation, now, what do you expect from this communication, from this Dawa session? Number two, what is the possible things that your prospect want? from this communication. Number three, okay? Number three is that 
what is the bare minimum you're willing to accept from this communication? Number four, what is the possible obstacle or challenges that might arise throughout the communication? Number five, how do you turn the obstacle or the challenges, okay, to become a benefit to the prospect or to you? And number six, the last, is that how you possible gonna end the conversations. Now, this ending of the conversations have to be related with what you want and what is the bare minimum. Now, this is meaning that there's a lot of thinking happening here. The listening skill, the observation skill, and then by looking at their body language as well. While you are talking, you are listening and looking at, like for example, I can see from a lot of your video, in which initially, a lot of people, when they come to you guys aggressively, they will be, hmm, hmm, okay? It's like they are getting aggressive and they try and we know. From this body language itself, we realize that they are being very defensive. They are attacking us, but yet they are being very defensive. Now, throughout the conversation, my, my goal right now in the soft skill is about his, he is right now here. Now, how can I and what should I do and what should I say to make him that from this position to change into a position which is more relaxed. When they are more relaxed, meaning they are more open to listen. They're no longer being defensive. If not, if they continue to be in this position, meaning whatever argument that I'm going to make, most probably, okay, they are listening, but they are listening not to understand. They are listening to answer and reply us immediately without giving us any chance. So my goal is to neutralize and make him comfortable. So, and you can see, I can see that based on your, your guys' video, most of them, after you guys give the argument, some of them will be, okay. They will become very, very open and then they will, the, the tone change. And then you can see their facial expression change. This is something that we will teach during our course that how do you observe someone? Are they interested in the way you talk? Are they having problems with your conversation, with your speed of speech, with your choice of word? How, how comfortable they are talking to you? Are they getting more jovial? Are they having fun with you? Or are they there just to defeat you and show to the world, hey man, I defeat the lion of Islam, for example. They can claim whatever they want to claim, right? So do soft skill, what to say, when to say. And sometimes we can, we are, we are sharing with our, pro, with, with our participant as well, how can you interject in a conversation without saying a word. How can you interject? Because for us, as we know, Prophet Sallam, whenever somebody speaks, he will never interject. But there is a time and place where in that one you need to, especially in the context of high Park, where people don't allow you opportunities to speak. When they ask you questions, and then they will keep up, okay, now you answer me. When we try to answer, they will interject us again. So we don't have the time. And I can see Brother Mazo, a lot of times we will say, now, you ask me, and I want to answer. Can you give me answer now? Let me answer now. Let me answer now. I answer. I finish my answer. Then you ask. Then it's your turn. Now it's my turn. Okay? You listen first. Right. So, those are part of the soft skill. When to say, and sometimes, because I know it's very noisy, and also when we are doing street dawah here in Malaysia, and, and other part of the world, we are always by the roadside. So, what do we do? We have to sometimes increase. The the key principle Keep it short and simple. But before that, we have the lick principle. It's some catchy phrase. Lick and kiss. Lick stands for loud. You have to speak loud. Loud doesn't mean you have to shout. Okay? And then we have I. There is an intonation. Your tone. And sometimes, to get people's attention, not really, you have to shout. Just like in school. When in the classroom, everybody is noisy. Sometimes the teacher will say, Assalamu alaikum, students. Okay. Are you guys here with me? Now, you speak very low, but yet the prospect, if you see, you can see from there, either the prospect is listening to you, then they will be like, what? Can you repeat again? Yeah, I'm saying something. You know what, brother, Hashim, there's something very important. What? Now, then you see that you want to neutralize the position. You don't want to go on on the momentum of the high pitch. No, we will change 
intonation. To say I love you, I think Mansur and Hashim, we have, I think, uh, used to say I love you, do we? Still? <laughs> <laughs> do we say I love you? Yes. But just imagine our spouse say the word I love you this way. Brother Mansur, Hashim, think about it. Our wife say this to us. I love you. What does it mean? I love you. What does it mean? Uh, I love you. Now, it's still the same word, but then they say, I love you. Now, same three words, but different way of expression mean differently. Okay? And then I, and then we have C, which is clear. Intonation, but yet you have to be clear. And then K, refer to kiss. So this is something very important that um, for us, how to empower our Da'i, do soft skill in which it won't be just only one day. We have to keep on practicing, practicing, and then eventually, inshallah, we will become a better communicator. And alhamdulillah, we have conducted these courses uh, multiple times. Uh, and alhamdulillah, the feedback that we got from our participants is not only improve their communication in da'wah, but they also have improved their communication with their spouse, with their family members, with their colleague, with their friends, and their relationship eventually become better. Because right now, they are using the prophetic method of communication. Why Allah is using Ya Ayyulazina Amanu, Ya Ayyuhannas, different context. How the Prophet Sallallahu is talking to a different group of people. Why Prophet Sallallahu always use the word man, when. And you really see the Prophet Sallallahu use the word like if. No. Very rare, Prophet will use the word if. Most of the time, he will use the word when. Why? When always signal for optimism. If is something, I'm not very sure. Maybe yes, maybe no. But Prophet Sassan always say, when the time comes, when the hours arrive, before the hours, when, when, when. It's something which is certainty, to tell us something certain. When I talk to a not yet Muslim, I will, I will use the word when you become Muslim, when you understand, when you willing to open your mind, when, I will not say if. Because if, it's like no commitment over there and no certainty, but when, we use the word when, it gives us a bit of cutting edge in terms of com communication and convictions as well. And I have That's to be right. very careful in terms of my choice of words. Very good advice in terms of even the, the type of or the choice of words that we need to have uh, when we're engaging. Um, some of them are very, of course, you know, positive, even even the way when you're actually using the difference between if and when. Jazakallah khairan for this one. So let's go into the challenges that a da'i faces. Um, because we are constantly engaging with people who are more and more learned, who are more and more aware of, because of the information age, Either the learned in the sense in the sense of misinformation, because they are learned, they have learned and accumulated this information from the internet, from the social media, all these misconceptions they have come across without actually going and filtering and critiquing whether this is actually true or not. So it brings them doubts about Islam, Shubha. And they project those doubts as well to Muslims. And one of the aim and objective of the anti-Muslim camp is to bring those doubt to the Muslims that, number one, they can make these Muslims away from Islam, and number two, any non-Muslim or yet to be Muslim, so that they don't even become interested in accepting Islam. So how do you deal, and what are the approaches you're taking in dealing with the shubhat or shubha, the doubts that arises um, from different camps, from ex-Muslims, from atheists, from evangelical Christians, for example, and what are our roles in dealing with that? So I'm going to ask both of you. So let's start with um, Brother Firdaus first, and I'm going to Brother Kaleem um, to elaborate this, inshallah, on this. I, I will think, uh, pass the mic to Kaleem first, the extent because he's been quiet for quite okay. some time. No problem. Tifadal, <laughs> Brother yes. Kaleem. Yes. Hashim went to take his biryani, I, think, I guess. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> MashaAllah. Uh, basically, as far as the, uh, the tough questions or challenging questions are concerned or the shubahat or the doubts are concerned about Islam, we all know we are living in the age of media. 
where these shubahat, these doubts are being propagated on different types of media, satellite TV media, social media, print media. You know, there are different ways how this is being propagated. So what should we do as the Muslim ummah? We need to be practical and pragmatic rather than taking everything together, like, you know, we, we can do all of it together. But we have to do our research, some R&D, to find out what are the most common questions or the most common shubahat that which are being propagated on the media today about Islam. Like, just to give you an example, uh, you know, this has been done by Dr. Zakir Naik, like right from the past three decades, he's been talking about the 20 most common questions that which the non-Muslims have about Islam. So to a beginner, for a person who wants to pursue dawah and who wants to answer the questions, he doesn't have to go into the ocean of questions that which are coming, you know, which are flooding every single day on different media for the Muslim ummah. He shouldn't get lost. He shouldn't be drowned. You know, there are chances that he may be overwhelmed and drowned in that ocean of questions. So first start with the most common questions. Start with the 20 set. Then when you're confident, mashallah, I have got some convincing answers from the Quran, from the Sunnah, from the comparative religion perspective, from scientific perspective, from the logical perspective. As you can see, that's, that's what the training is all about by Dr. Naik and his team, that we focus on these five things. Quran and Sunnah, comparative religion, a scientific and logical and reasoning. So if you put all these things together and you get the convincing answers, then you're confident. At least I know the 20 most common questions. I know the answers to them from various perspectives. You go furthermore. Then there are some common questions asked by non-Muslims. Then there are common questions asked by the Christian missionaries. There are common shubahat and doubts that which are raised by the Hindus. There are common questions and doubts that which are raised by the atheists. So try to get the most important questions and try to get a convincing answer to these. And Alhamdulillah, you will feel yourself to be confident. You made your foundation strong. And then Alhamdulillah, if you happen to come across such a question, at least you have the courage. If not 100%, maybe you can give 60%, 70% of the answer. And Alhamdulillah, that produces good results. And it is an effective way of doing dawah. And to pursue this further, Alhamdulillah, uh, besides the 114 questions that which have been already uploaded on Dr. Zakir Naik's website, that which everyone can access to, we at MRM, Alhamdulillah, now we want to take it further. We have under uh, we have been undertaking a great project, and it's a dream project of Brother Firdaus Wong, and I believe, inshallah, he can also add on some points to it, which we call it as an encyclopedia on the challenging questions about Islam. We are trying to gather all types of questions coming from different groups, from different perspectives, and trying to compile answers to all of this, alhamdulillah, to, uh, you know, some people are mentioning me. <laughs> okay, so trying to put across all these questions in one place, so that, inshallah, we have the answers to the most stupid of questions, that which we may consider to be stupid, but it's the most you know, commonly asked question by the non-Muslims, but trying to answer them in a brief, a simple and understandable way. Why do we want to do this? So that inshallah, all our Muslim brothers and sisters who may not be you know, or coming from an Islamic university background, who may, don't, who may not have a bachelor's or a master's in Sharia or in jurisprudence in other things, we are giving them the most simplest answers so that they can learn them, try to memorize them, and inshallah, try to answer these questions on different forms of media, whether it be talking to a person one-to-one, -one, or whether it be answering questions on your social media group, on Facebook, on Twitter, on YouTube, or your own family or friends' WhatsApp groups. When people are raising such questions, answer them. Start with that. So Alhamdulillah, I believe uh, this project, inshallah, is going to be done soon. We hope to finish this. Uh, hopefully, inshallah, by the end of the year, we may have you know, something to present it to the people, inshallah. And this is an ongoing process. So I believe, inshallah, uh, people will benefit from this. And especially those who want to take dawah.
as a career, whether part-time or full-time, hopefully they are going to benefit as well, inshallah. MashaAllah, MashaAllah, very great initiatives. I just want to make a quick point here before we go to Brother Firdos to elaborate uh, a bit more on this. You see, uh, our brothers and sisters, whenever you come across a shubha, a doubt that are raised, I mean, look at it from this point of view. These kind of questions have been raised or criticism against Islam has been raised from a long time, even before we were born, centuries before. And what have you seen from your experience? You've seen these questions and criticisms or allegations and objections, they have been all answered properly, adequately and justifiably without leaving any room for any confusion. Because this is the clarity and the beauty of Islam where it doesn't leave anyone to be confused in his theology, in his belief, in his practices, in the wisdom that is associated within the Sharia of Islam. So throughout the centuries, all these allegations and criticism that came by, they have been debunked or refuted or answered properly and adequately. And you will see hundreds of websites and YouTube channels who have in, in their capacities have been answering these questions and laid those criticism to rest. What um, brothers are doing in MRM, they are going making into an encyclopedia of a work where you can access those materials for your convenience, not to have some doubts left within you. In fact, why should you even have doubts to begin with? Because from your experience, you know that these are not an, an issue for the Muslims. So if you are in principle having uh, coming across a doubt, the first thing you should be is, okay, fine. Of course, there's going to be an answer to this. You are not uh, in a position to access that yet. Maybe you haven't come across the solution or an answer to that yet. Your position is not going to be one of skepticism. Oh, yes, now my iman is shaking. Oh, no. I mean, how am I going to live as a Muslim now anymore? Your position is be that, okay, this is something that's been people are asking or raising. Let me find out what the scholars have to say about this. You should not be in a position of like, subhanAllah, I mean, you know, I am no longer now, you know, my, my faith is shaking. This is precisely what their aim and objective is, to make you a little bit, shaky in your foundation and then they instill the other things you know like a, a machine gun tactic and say what about this and that and that and eventually trying to derail you but you need to take a different approach and inshallah i'm going to ask brother for those in terms of what exactly is that approach a muslim should take whenever they come across yeah. okay. before brother okay. for those just want to apologize i had to go away because it is time for us for here and the maghrib, maghrib is approaching so it catches okay. up very quickly there's very less time that's fine so, in, in that case i will let uh, brother for those answer the question and i'll take a quick answer break inshallah yes, and take brother yes. hashim uh, um take long inshallah. Brother for those. Okay, okay sure okay uh, i know you guys are always uh you have to pray with zohor asar and maghrib oh, you yeah. know, it's very, very we can do it all in the same wudu <laughs> just just that we thought that you are having your biryani, mashallah. <laughs> oh, I wish, I wish. I'm waiting for Kaleem, inshallah, to invite me to his home. One day I visit him and he makes me a nice biryani, inshallah. And you know, there's a lot of people who ask us to invite both of you to come to Malaysia. But inshallah, we will make it happen uh, in the near future, inshallah. Yeah. Uh, so we will have a very fruitful uh, session. Now, uh, building on from what Kaleem has mentioned about uh, the encyclopedia. Now, it is something which is uh, my personal goal uh, through MRM that to come up with this encyclopedia. Okay, uh, We hope to contribute something and to leave a legacy that will be beneficial to us even after we're no longer here. And this encyclopedia, we embarked on it uh, two years back, I think one year plus back, Okay, and started with uh, collecting questions. Okay, different questions, and sometimes the same questions can be from different different groups. I give you an example. Okay, uh, the example of, uh, for example, okay, now, um, why your God, why your God allows suffering? Now, again, these questions can come from an atheist, right? These questions can come from Hindu, this question can come from Christian, from any, any other uh, religion followers. Now, different people, different groups, different backgrounds, same questions, we will have a different way of answering. 
And our approach, the approach that we have shared with our team members here in MRM in Malaysia is that we are not going to be apologetic in a sense that, you know, uh, we take a stance of being defensive. I'm a footballer, but I'm a footballer. I love to play football. The best defense is to attack, to attack intellectually. So rather than we answer that question, if these questions are being asked by the adherents of other religion who believe in God, rather than we try to defend our position, we ask them, now, I can answer you this question, but I would like to ask you this question as well, that, okay, what did your God do in that situation too? Now, if they are Hindu, if they are Christian, if they are any particular followers of any religion that believe in God, now, that question should be applied to them too. It should not be exclusively being asked to a Muslim. What is your answer as a Hindu, as a Christian? If their answer is they don't have any answer, okay, that's good. Meaning, your religion, you have a doubt in your own religion already. What is the purpose of life, for example? Now, according to your book, not according to what you think. If we were to ask them, what is the concept of God in your religion? In Islam, we have a clear concept of God in religion, in which we have the chapter and the verse, very specifically. But then, how do you talk about your, the justice of your religion? So, likewise, those are our ap approach. For when it comes to the encyclopedia, we will have the same questions, but answer differently. Okay? Yes, yes. No, no. Does Islam allow this? If yes, yes. Okay? And then we will quote from other scriptures. Other scriptures. And from historical point of view. And analogy as well. And this encyclopedia, inshallah, uh, we will make it an effort uh, to translate into at least three main languages. Uh, English, okay, and we have Bahasa, and then and Chinese as well, to make it accessible for every single one to have the correct answer. And then my advice, just like what Brother Manso asked me, when they encounter certain shubaha by any particular group, first and foremost, our understanding, our principle is, I'm, I know there is an answer in this life. Absolutely. With yeah. every, with every, I always do this. Even in the Malaysia uh, mainstream media as well, I always mention this, that with every attack from any particular groups toward Islam, if they say there is a problem in the Quran, if they say, if they say so, there is a problem in the Quran, in this words. Okay. Now, if you want to quote our book, and there is a problem, and if what they say is true, indeed, we know it's not, but just for the sake of discussion, if indeed there is one problem, or maybe let's talk about 10, 10 problems with the Quran. Now, you should use, the problem is not the problem. The problem is, what is your justice to judge this is a problem? If you say there is 10 problems with the Quran, and therefore you should, I should reject Islam, now, to use the same yastik, you should even leave your religion much earlier. Because your book might have more problems than the Quran. If we go into the theory of probability, you always have to go with the book. For example, just for the sake of discussion, hope nobody will quote me on this. Then you should go on a book which has less problem. If you're going to buy a car with the same price. Now, one is 10,000 pounds, one is 8,000, one is 3,000 pounds. Okay. All the same car, same model, same year. Okay? And that's the problem. If let's say every car is 10,000, one have more problem, one have less problem. Then you will go with the car, we have less problem because all are the same price. Right? So if you were to use that logic, you should even leave your religion much earlier. If you think that is a problem, people are attacking Islam. Oh, the Quran have this problem. Oh, the I Hadith think, have this problem. Yeah. This is a very right. important point, you know, with regards to, in fact, this not only for the non-Muslims, but there are many Muslims who have actually left them because they couldn't find the answer. And as you, Brother Fidus, correctly um, stated earlier, that Islam has answers to all these questions. But unfortunately, because these individuals who maybe question this critical questioning within their faith, 
their parents were not educated enough about the deen to answer these questions. Maybe the imam wasn't educated enough to answer this question in the masjid. Yes, so they tried whatever they could, and then maybe they went online because they couldn't find any place uh, near their home to answer those questions or anyone reliable in their community. So when they go online, what they do is they find all these crazy people, you know, uh, spreading misinformation. They might type something on Google to uh, uh, to basically respond, see if they can find a response to this. And unfortunately, many times, these Islamophobic websites are the first one that come in the search engine, okay? Because they spend a lot of time. I mean, it's a billion dollar industry, Islamophobia. The people all over the world, they are, they jump the, uh, the what do you say, the bandwagon uh, of Islamophobia to make quick bucks. And many of them, because they spend a lot of money uh, in the search engine, in the SEO, the search engine optimization, it comes at the top because they spend money on those. And they go by that answer. And sometimes these websites or these, um, what do you say? Play, uh, yeah, these particular websites or social media platforms, they're disguised in such a way that they are actually Islamic when they are not. So it's, it's, it's a deception because at the end of the day, they're, what do you say, their main objective is to make money and they would actually do anything to do that. And many times this website might be even just so they can move you away from Islam. They don't bother whether you come become a Christian or a Jew or an atheist or whatever it is. They don't bother about that. For them, the main objective is to take you away from the. And that is why this encyclopedia, which you talk about, is quite crucial because there are answers out there, definitely. But they might be buried in a book, maybe in Arabic, which many of us actually do not have access to because we can't read that language or might be in some other language which we don't have access to. And... In the English-speaking world, uh, the what do you say? The amount of information out there today, Alhamdulillah, is good, but we can do much better. And there are a lot of Muslims with a lot of resources. If the non-Muslims can actually spend a lot of money to build their platforms to take you away from your deen, then what are the Muslims doing today? You know, Alhamdulillah, we build masajids, we build madaris, we build all these things. We give charity money for uh, digging a well somewhere. Alhamdulillah, that is all well and good. But what counts in the Akhirah other than just a charity is that the Muslims today, Alhamdulillah, whatever we have today, let's unite them, let's work together so that we can actually save people. I know he died at the end of the days in the hands of Allah. We can actually make an effort to save those people who are on the brink of leaving Islam because of these doubts, because of these questions they had, which their parents or their the, the leaders in their society were inept or unable to respond to. So make it easy for them. Make it easy like they would go and Google in the first link or maybe on the first page. Um, inshallah, Brother Firdos is, uh, what do you say, encyclopedia or Wikipedia, whatever it is, Islamic Wikipedia comes on top. And then they can go by that answer, you know. Alhamdulillah, there are good websites like IslamQA.com. I think I, I've used uh, a lot of uh, responses from there. But inshallah, we need a lot more specifically geared towards apologetics. Because fatwas are important, alhamdulillah, for the Muslims. But there are many questions which are actually not there on those sites. Like, how do I respond to things about evolution? What are the details on it? What about uh, other questions they ask me, critical questions, which are to do with philosophy and so on. So Alhamdulillah, the Muslims, you know, we have, mashallah, we have so many ulamas uh, who have already answered this in the past, you know, but these guys, they just kind of regurgitate the same thing over and over again. But inshallah, we need cogent answers, clear answers in a, in a medium and a language which many of us will benefit, inshallah. Barakallah. Yeah. Assalamu alaikum once again. Um, yeah. Just in the interest of time, I want to just cover a few other points, inshallah, before we finally go to q and I'm sure a lot of brothers and sisters are eagerly waiting to ask you important questions, which they feel yeah. is pressing. So we mentioned about shubha and doubts and other things that we are facing in modern times. One of the other things that many people may not realize the important influence that's causing is the issues of scientism. So I would like one of you or both of you to come across, uh, if, if you, I'm sure you have, to explain the, the, the real need to understand this issue, specifically the issues of scientism, and why that we need to be aware of it. Because many of the arguments in modern day, in the modern day of science, people may bring this issue. 
So what is scientism? What is the problem of this scientism in terms of that? And why need to, we need to know about it? Why, why is it that I'm even asking you this question about it? Okay. Um, I will answer first, then Kalim will top up on, <laughs> on top of it, inshallah. My teacher will top up whatever that I left. <laughs> <laughs> okay, when we talk about scientism, scientism in a nutshell is, uh, is being known as uh, by using science as a yardstick and the objective of every single thing. Okay? The, 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 the measurement of truth is based on science. Now, there is, there is pro and there is a con. And those who support scientism, okay, they should be fair and just as well that, you know, there is a criticism toward this approach as well, okay? But uh, we are not going into the academic discussions about what scientism, what is the approach, what is the uh, criticism people have and among the scientists towards this approach as well. And yes, nowadays, we can see the rise of such a movement in which uh, scientism, everything based on science, everything based on science. Now, the good thing is, uh, a lot of people will say that there are multiple ways of approach when it comes to the scientism, okay? There's a different way of approach. The thing is, people who always quote or they would like to affiliate themselves, they do not call themselves as scientism as per se, but the way they talk, they always try to look very rational. But then, throughout the conversation, and I would say maybe 20 to 30 minutes in, into the conversation, we will start to realize that they sound intellectual, they sound rational, but then eventually we can see their questions and their argument has developed into an emotional argument. Okay? Have developed into image emotional argument. And how do we approach this? Okay, and based on our experience, of course, I would like to learn from uh, Brother Mansour and Brother Hashim as well. Uh, how do you guys deal with these issues there? Is that based on our experience here in Malaysia and of course uh, dealing in Africa, we don't really encounter that. Okay, in Latin America, people are still quite religious by following Christianity, either Catholic or Protestant, Protestant or any other de denomination. Okay, but let's talk about Asia and maybe uh, some other part of the world where people have become less religious. How do we deal with it? Number one, if they were to use science to claim something. Now, the problem is they are using this argument against us by saying there is no proof that God exists. In which if let's say for the sake of discussion, if let's say they are really sincere for the sake of this post discussion, then this answer will be enough for them. But if they are there just for argument, regardless of how many journals or how many scientists that we quote, they will not accept it. Because some people, they already have a preconceived notions in their mind that when I ask this question, I only want this answer. Therefore, our approach sometimes will be when somebody asks a particular question that is based on science, we will ask them, which scientist that you want me to quote from? Which, what answer do you want? Do you have any specific answer? If they say yes, and I ask them, do you know what is the answer to your own question in the first place? Now, I have to qualify this thing because my goal is to neutralize first. If I were to ask them, do you know the answer to this question? No. Then do you have any particular answer that you want from this question? If they say no, then yes, I will proceed to answer. If they say I know the answer. I just want to listen from you. Why not you tell me what is your answer? Because when you already have the answer, meaning whatever that I'm going to say that will be different from your answer, you will not accept it, regardless who I, who I quoted and whatever journals that I quoted, whatever book that I quoted. Okay? And that's why two, three years ago, we have a conversation with a group of ex-Muslim ethics here in Malaysia in our office. Okay? I think that was the first time in which I make up a call up to ex-Muslim. Okay, come and join us. Let's have a conversation. And you know what is funny about that conversation is that, okay, that basically one hour into the conversation, all of them, when I say all, it's really all. <laughs> all of them, with no argument, they have their coffee, okay, they have their coffee, they have their food, some snack, 
we have a very casual chat. Okay? All of them, eventually they say, I think I'm not qualified to become an atheist. I don't think I'm an atheist. <laughs> but when they came in, they claim that they are atheists. Okay? But then when they came in, after one hour conversation, all of them, we have all these things video recorded with their permission in which we have shared the recording with them and we have already promised them that we will not air it anywhere. No way. It's just that for our research purposes and they agree with it. No issue. One hour into the conversation, they say, after this discussion, I think I can't call myself an atheist. I think I'm more qualified to become an agnostic. When one, body, one, one person say that, the next, the next, the next, then they say, yeah, I think I agree with him. Yeah, I, so I think I agree with him. So eventually, all of them become from atheists, become agnostic. Because by definition, in the absence of evidence, you cannot claim something exists. Yes, for the sake of discussion, I agree. But yet, in the same time, in the absence of that evidence itself, you cannot claim that something doesn't exist in the same time. So how can you claim that there is no God? How can you be for sure? If in this our conversation, we know who is Hashim, how does it look like? We know who is Mansour. Now, if just now Hashim left the conversation, we can be for sure say, oh, Hashim is not with us. What he do, we do not know. But we know for sure Hashim is not with us because he's not replying. We do not see his video. We do not know. Uh, there's no response from him. So we know he's not here because we know exactly who is Hashim. But if anybody who subscribes to the ideology of scientism by saying, no, there's no evidence, empirical evidence, just for the sake of discussion, anyway. There's no empirical evidence for the existence of God. Then likewise, in the absence of evidence, yes, you might claim something doesn't exist, but in the same time, in the absence of evidence, you cannot claim or deny there is a, there is a probability of something exists. Those, those are our, some of our easier approach dealing with this matter because we realize people who always quote science, they have this tendency, basically, their understanding about science itself might not be very strong. They might fail their science subject, but because they want to look good, they want to position themselves as someone intellectual, and then they quote, you know, that, that scientist, when you ask them, what does that terms mean? They couldn't explain to you. They just read, paraphrase, and then they just lash it out at us. So why do we want to deal with them when they just want to show that they want to fake it until they make it? They cannot convince you, they confuse you. That's what they do. So our yes. approach is generally to neutralize them. So Brother Kalim, please add on. I think, mashallah, you've covered um, most of the points. Uh, uh, me as an individual, uh, I've learned, mashallah, from different people, different approaches. Uh, as our mentor, Dr. Nai has an approach when it comes to science, when it comes to dealing with science. You know, his a popular lecture, which he has delivered in many places called Quran and Modern Science. So his approach is, you know, to kill two birds with one stone. That you prove the Quran is the word of God and it has scientific a phenomena mentioned in it, which the science has recently discovered. So you put forward the question to the person uh, who thinks that Islam is an unscientific religion or Islam is outdated. So you ask him the question every time you quote a scientific phenomena in the Quran that who could have mentioned it 1400 years before? Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was an ummi. He was not a learned person. Who could have told him about this scientific phenomena mentioned in the Quran 1400 years ago? This is one approach. Whereas the second approach that which I learned from Brother Firdos, mashallah, uh, after having worked with him, is the paradox. The paradox of certain scientists believing in God and the other group of scientists who deny God. So now you should question your prospect who considers science to be his yardstick. Now, if you deny the existence of God, which group of scientists do you belong to? Because there is one group of scientists who believes in God. There's another group of scientists who does not believe in God. So you are in a paradox now. So this is a very simple, straightforward question to ask so that they start thinking. And thirdly, I have learned from, mashallah, from Brother Mansoor and Brother Hashim by watching the videos on uh, uh, the Dawa Corner, I mean the Speaker's Corner. And mashallah, one such video I would like to remind Brother Mansoor is that the discussion he had about evolution. And 
just a couple of months before we made that video for Fakir Ilmu, wherein, as Brother Firdos said, that they might sound to be too rational and they might sound to be too, you know, pro, you know supposedly to be very intelligent and knowledgeable. You ask them about Lamarck's theory. They didn't know about Lamarck. They didn't know about the giraffe growing a long neck because of the survival of the fittest. So stupid of them. And subhanAllah, and the argument that which you gave that they think that even a higher complex organism can lower down in evolution and become a cockroach. So we made that cockroach picture and put it on the thumbnail on YouTube to prove to them that these people who claim to be having knowledge of science, they don't even know the basics of evolution. Forget about uh, the, you know, the intricacies of how many scientists have proven it to be wrong and how many scientists have given counter evidences for evolution to be debunked. They don't know about it. They are living in their own cocoon. So to expose them with the basic knowledge and with the basic elements of the scientific uh, yardstick that we're just sticking onto, I believe, alhamdulillah, is going to be very beneficial depending upon the prospect. You can use Dr. Zakir Naik's approach. You can use Brother Firdos's approach. You can use Brother Mansus's approach. And mashallah, there are so many other approaches to deal with this fitna that which we are living with. It is called as, you know, science is the most superior. Science is their God. As, uh, you know, we know Albert Einstein, the great scientist said that, uh, you know, a science without religion is blind and religion without science is lame. So both can be reconciliated and both can, inshallah, be studied in their basics and hopefully can uh, produce good results in our dawah, inshallah. Well, oh, mashallah, that's a beautiful response from both Brother Fedos and Brother Kaleem as well, mashallah. You know, there is actually a very important ayah in the Quran which I would like to bring to your attention. I don't know if you've come across, I've discussed it at Speaker's Corner. So this is the ayah which I use. Allah said, we will show you, we'll show them our signs in the horizons and within themselves until it becomes clear to them that it is the truth. Now, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I mean, obviously you can interpret this in so many different ways, you know. Obviously the horizons is probably the, the horizon that we see or even beyond the space, the space, whatever horizon is available there as far as your telescopes can see, you know. They never stop learning. The more they, the more powerful, what do you say, um, instruments these scientists develop, the more they find out the beauty and the, what do you say, the, uh, uh, the treasures that that are in this uh, in space and even even the oceans they haven't discovered yet all of it you know like your own, the the very earth that we live in they haven't discovered all of it yet it's only a fraction of that so can you imagine how vast the the space is and what else is there to be discovered there um but then allah says something else and within themselves until it becomes clear to them that it is the truth. Now, when the scientists, they speak about all these different theories, there's different postulates, you know, different, um, what is the discoveries they have, what are they using? They're using their faculties on the faculty of reasoning um, and reasoning. And all of this is obviously connected to one's own, what do you say, your consciousness. So your consciousness is something that they do not have epistemic evidence for. But without a doubt, whether they are atheists, agnostic, believing in God, theists, or not believing in God, they all will admit that we all have consciousness. Because without that, your existence is meaningless. Yes, as Descartes said, uh, I think, therefore I am. Yes, your ability to think is your identity. Yes, because you're different. How does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala differentiate you from animals? We are a unique creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why Allah has given us this ability to reason and thought. And that's why we're able to um, develop civilizations, publish books, you know, make the streams, for example, and all the technology that goes in space and uh, within the depths of the ocean. Without this consciousness, all of this is completely and utterly meaningless. But ask them, do you have any empirical evidence for your consciousness? And they, you will hear either, uh, if they're honest, they'll say, no, we don't. Because that is the reason this is called the hard problem of consciousness. Because without having empirical evidence, which they keep demanding for everything, except this most important thing within themselves. 
And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that these are the signs which will make it clear to them that this is the truth. Yes. And the only people who would deny it, either they are dishonest, disingenuous, and these people will never, Allah will not even give them hidayah. Allah says in the Quran clearly that if these people, if you are a liar, if you're dishonest, then Allah will not give you hidayah. Because you you don't want to accept the truth, even if it's in front of you. So this is another important point you should add to your arsenal of dealing with people who actually claim scientism or those who claim that we don't need a God. Explain to, you know, because this is the faculty they use all the time, which they cannot explain. Can you imagine? The very faculty they doubt with their critical questioning, with their questioning of whether Allah exists or not, yes, whether uh, Prophet Muhammad is real or not, or his miracles and all, all this without their intellect, without their reasoning, which is connected to their consciousness, is meaningless. Just a few additional points on these issues about science. Muslims were never against science. Islam and science were like twin sisters. I mean, if you look at the development, the Muslim scientist or scientist within the Islamic civilization achieved it is, you know, it's, it's a huge amount of contribution to the world, uh, you know, science and technology. N many of the things that we now take it for granted is because of the scientific method that Muslims put in place back then. So I, I don't want to just bore people with the amount of the contributions within the different fields. Uh, whether it's agriculture, botany, physics, astronomy, chemistry, biology, Muslims have contributed enormously um, to such extent that even at one point, Al Qanun fi Al Tib by Ibn Sina, his book on medicine, his canon of medicine, was a textbook for hundreds of years in Europe, went through so many different editions. And many of the instruments, surgical instruments, the device that is still being used today within the form that have been devised. That's how precise and how you know, you know genius they were because of the the drive that the Quran and the Sunnah had to go and discover. When Allah says, you know, see you roof fil ardi, go inside the earth, not just go on the earth. You know, the traditional understanding is, you know, we can go and deep down our the earth and see how Allah originated creation and various things. So science have never been something, uh, you know, Islam thought antagonistically and that, you know, it's like if you are going to, you know, tread the path of science, you lose your religion. It's never the case. It's the opposite. That's point number one. Point number two, science is a particular genre of avenues of knowledge with this particular system of arriving to this knowledge um, of, of experimentation and observation and so on. It has limitations. So we know that science will ever change based on our more and more advanced learning, advanced learning through technological developments with tools and resources. So at one point, what we knew a few hundred years ago, it might totally turn upside down and we know something differently now because of our scientific revolution. And scientific revolutions happened throughout the centuries. When I say revolution, the revolution that totally upturned and changed the way of what, how we thought about our reality, our natural world. So science has limitations because of the tools and because of the method that it uses. And the final point I want to say is about this. Look, Quran talks about many things, but the Quran talks about things which you can observe and come to the realization that, yes, whenever it's in the future, like when the Quran says the hammering of the stars, you know, the hammering sound of the stars, people may not have known then, but at one point it will be a reality. So there is a multifaceted, multi-layered meaning of the Quran in which this natural phenomena information is embedded. It's for us to discover and for us to go and research because that's what the Quran is saying. Go and find out. Allah talks about this. You know, don't they reflect? Don't they think about these things? And Allah praises these people who, you know, sitting and lying down, they, they, they make this reflection about this world. So science will, will never be an antagonistic avenue for Muslims to begin with. And whenever you come across people who are saying Quran contains science, it's because either they don't understand science, as both of your brothers or all of your brothers are highlighted, or they don't understand what the Quran is saying. So this is the problems of scientism. We've covered quite comprehensively. Jazakumullahu khairan. I want to just touch now, what other influences do we get from the West when it comes to the, the avenue of da'wah? 
that we want to um, share with our audience? Either something of a benefit or something that is obstacle or something that we need to be aware of influence from the West when it comes to Dawa. Uh, I think uh, personally, on my personal level, I think uh, there's a lot of benefit. Uh, there's a lot of good things that we have learned from the West. And, uh, I think uh, I, I, I will basically call it uh, dynamic, okay, and the passion for Dawa from you guys uh, in the West. Uh, because I realized, and this is what I mentioned in my speech as well in Malaysia, uh, in which I say, now look look at our brothers and sisters in the West, in which they are the minority in that land. But you can see that they are very active, proactive and aggressive in that one. But unlike us here in Malaysia, of course, not I, I'm not here to belittle anyone, but I would say in terms of the spirit for that one, you can see that they are willing to defend their right as a minority. Okay? And you can see they, they have the passion to spread the deen when they are the minor, minority. And here, right here, we are here in Malaysia or in Indonesia, how aggressive we are in spreading our deen. In fact, we have become more apologetic, okay, and more defensive. And sometimes we are more willing, we are willing to attack amongst our Muslim brethren in order to please the non-Muslim. So, I, I, again, we, I have to make a disclaimer here. Islam encourages us to build a good relationship with anybody else, with everybody else. Okay? Hablu min Allah and hablu min nas. And that is very clear. And no one should question that. It is very clear in the Quran and in the Hadith as well, in the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Okay, but those are the things, the good things, and of course the dynamic, the approach, uh, and alhamdulillah, uh, from the West we always can see that there is always new idea, innovative ideas, innovative way to do that one. Uh, I think in UK as well, you guys have a lot of uh, people coming up with new approach. Like for example, we're talking about Gorat. I personally, I never really learned about Gorat, but. Alhamdulillah, I, I was brief about what is Gorem and Alhamdulillah, a lot of people benefited from it and there is a good approach as well. You simplify that work for people. Like what you guys are doing in Hyde Park is very good. What our Sheikh, Sheikh Usman is doing in, in, in the in other part is very good as well. So those are the good things and of course to make uh, education easier. But having said so, um, the things that uh, we learn from the West is that sometimes we have made Islam, unfortunately, I have to be, I mean, we have to be very blunt. Uh, and this is, people who follow me, they will know that uh, Fridaus is blunt. <laughs> I'm very blunt in my, uh, in my word to speak the truth. Is that we have make Islam like a commodity. What do I mean by making Islam like a commodity? Unfortunately, we have made education, the access to education, Islamic education, is only for those privileged, for those who have money, for those who can afford to pay. But how about those who want to learn, but they could not afford to pay? And this is something that uh, puzzling me, that sometimes I have this without referring to any particular groups, is that why are we willing to invite a sheikh, a scholar, all the way from other parts of the world, I mean, in terms of the accommodations, the traveling, flight, whatsoever, and then when they come to another part of the world to give a lecture or a workshop, well, only 200 people or 300 people or 400 people can afford to pay that money, and they benefit from it. That, you, they can do a recording for that, but yet they are not doing it for free. I know you have to sustain your da'wah. I agree with that. You have to sustain your da'wah, but there must be a way how you can make Islamic education. If your goal is really about empowering the ummah, then making our workshop as a commodity where only people who can afford to pay can access to our education, I have some problem. I'm not saying it's haram. I have some problem with it. And as well as, I think from the West, is with, this is what I got from my sheikh as well, is that expanding the da'wah is good. But we have to understand what do we mean by expanding the da'wah. Expanding the da'wah is where we train more people, okay, to help 
to empower the da'wah. We do not go to any, I think, uh, whatever collaborations that we're going to have between MRM and da'wah wise, this is something that I'm looking forward to because it's something very clear that we are working on each other's strength, we are complementing each other. I, I do not like the ideas personally. And again, I have to make it very clear, I'm not saying this is haram, but I'm saying, what I'm saying is that if we really want to expand the da'wah, we should help the local organizations who know the local people and the local culture and the local context, rather than we set up or we establish another NGO with our name, and then we are hiring from the local people. And sometimes, sadly, we are poaching from other Islamic NGO to establish our own team in the particular part of the world, in which we are not uniting the Muslim. We are dividing the Muslim even further. And then the only thing that is different between us is just the name. What is there in the name? And this is a big problem for me. This is a problem for me in which should not happen. Should not happen. Our, our goal in Da'wah is about how can we unite and how can we empower each other not to divide each other. Okay? And I think uh, there, there's a lot of uh, more benefit that I... I uh, Absolutely. We can get from Absolutely. Barakallah. I just want to highlight a, a point to our guests who are on the chat and commenting saying whether oh, it's live or not. So questions coming from Fahmi or Iqbal are saying, is it Iqbal or was it Nasushan or something? Yes, we are live and we are going to take your question soon. Please join in um, and come into the stream with the link that's provided and we'll take your question inshallah. This is not recorded um, as of now today. Um, uh, but it, we are still live, so please join in the live discussions, and we will take questions from you. So, Barakallah fi um, for the beautiful discussions that uh, we listened to today. So many beneficial aspects, practical aspects of Dawa, in terms of how we should approach, in terms of what we should be learning and what we should be avoiding, and how to deal with, you know, criticism and objections. So this is, inshallah, is going to be beneficial across the globe, especially with these collaborations where the in the East and West are meeting to discuss the challenges that we each are facing and how we can take uh, an approach in which we take the best which suits our need and our context and use that method to do effective da'wah. Because da'wah is something that we all can do within our capacities that we are learning as Muslims. Even if you cannot do because you can't say things, even if you cannot convey a message, at least through your behavior, through your actions, through your doings, whatever you do as a Muslim, in your workplace, in your studies, in your interactions with others, at least they would know that, why is this person like that? So honest, so reliable, so calm, so compassionate, so just, so X, Y, and Z. All the positive virtues, as Islam wants us to model our lives with, that itself is the best dawah. As you know, Muhammad Sallallahu was described as the walking Qur'an because he implemented in his life, in his actions, all that is required of him by Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala in terms of how he does da'wah to the people. So even if you are not able to say something with your words, do with your actions, with your behaviors, with your interactions. So Jazakumullah khairan um, to all of you brothers. Um, you know, well, Brother Mansur, I would just like to uh, uh, make a short comment or a tip, inshallah, with regards yeah. to da'wah by akhlaq. Uh, we all know, MashaAllah, Allah, Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala mentioned in Surah Fusila, chapter 41, verse number 33. And who is better in speech who calls people towards Allah? We see the importance of giving da'wah through speech here. Then immediately after that, Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala follows it with, salihat, And you have to do righteous deeds. So MashaAllah, both the righteous deeds... The good deeds that which Islam has told us to do and the speech, both are important for a Muslim to do dawah. But there is another point. The another point that how you can convert your actions into dawah is Allah wa ta'ala answers in the last part. وَقَالَ إِنَّنِي مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ And say that you are from among the Muslims. You follow the religion of Islam. So how do you do that? Whenever you project any good character, whether the way how you speak, the honesty in your businesses that which you deal with or you never speak lies or you always respect and be courteous to people. 
do not attribute even though alhamdulillah your parents must have given you a good upbringing your culture may demand you to be soft to be gentle to be polite alhamdulillah but at that point of time give the credit to islam wa qala innani minal muslimin it is islam who taught me to be polite it is islam who taught me to be always honest it is islam who told me to be just in everything every dealing that which i do it is islam that which tells me to do this to do that so every time you get an opportunity to project your actions to the people as a muslim give the credit to islam and alhamdulillah your akhlaq as brother hashim pointed out to the hadith from muatta the prophet said alayhi salatu wassalam wa uh, i have been sent inna ma bu'istu li utammima maqarim al akhlaq i have been sent only to perfect the character of the people and by that we understand that this character has been molded by the quran and the sunnah of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam so brothers dawa can be done in various ways including your actions but remember to attribute this to your beautiful religion of islam jazakumullah khair barakallahu feek uh it seems like it's quite late in malaysia probably midnight already for you guys isn't it so I really appreciate your patience and thank you everyone uh first and foremost to our co-panelists here uh brother fedos and brother kalim jazakumullah khairan for the beautiful advice the beautiful the beautiful insight and quite beneficial we spoke a lot about the character building this is which i think it's it's pretty known as uh, your emotional intelligence which is i think quite high if you look at many of the people even in the west who might not be believing in god or so for, for them emotional intelligence is quite an important thing and that's the reason prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam mentioned this in the hadith even though might be not using the same terminology but it's something that alhamdulillah allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has also mentioned in the quran and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in the hadith as well so first and foremost i want to say that we are going to go to q and a now but before that i want to say if you can actually um subscribe to dawa wise channel we have the nusantara channel here which is the which you'll find on our website so if you go to dawawise.com the link is there for all the three uh, channels we have we have the main channel in english we have an arabic channel and then we have this nusantara channel which is just launched um we put up the first video today uh, so inshallah we've already got 50 subscribers from you guys that's a good start alhamdulillah not bad on first day uh, inshallah allah put baraka in this and all the other dawa projects out there uh, so please do subscribe to brother firdaus's website uh, sorry his um, his what do you say his uh, youtube channel which is linked in the description i'm sure he's got a nice uh, facebook page as well uh, and he's on twitter and i believe on instagram and all the other places give me those uh, links and i'll put them in the description inshallah brother firdaus and i don't know if brother kalim has any social media links but if you do please do share with us um, and then we'll put that in the description as well so people get to know you as well mashallah you have worked with a lot of uh, what do you say legends out there like uh, but uh, ustaz zakir naik mashallah so i'm sure you have accumulated a lot of wealth and we want to benefit from that and the same with uh, brother firdaus as well Uh, and that's the reason for this you know we want to reach out to the global um what is a community and the global duaat out there we don't just want to stick to the west we we have we are an ummah the ummah is not just the west or the east it's all of us together in this yes so inshallah let's uh, collaborate let's cooperate uh, for the benefit of the deen and for da'wah and most importantly fi sabilillah for the sake of allah and to, and to please him so now during the q and a just want to mention that this is not we are not going to apologetics here so any non muslims who wish to join unless you have a question with regards to this topic which is basically connecting dawa and how we should give dawa what do you what do you found beneficial what do you want as an improvement and the same uh, for the muslims as well unless you have this topic to discuss we will not be entertaining anything and it's so one question per person no exceptions because we have got limited time we've already been online like over 3 hours and these brothers have to go home it's midnight over there so please do respect them inshallah and jazakallah khair um to all the moderators who have been helping us in the background uh, may allah give you all baraka and inshallah please keep them in your duas as well jazakallah khair so i'm going to put the link um while i'm doing that if mansur wants to yeah. anyone wants to ask questions on the comment section in the chat just type in first question and then your or big q and then what your question is and of course those who are able to please join through the link and 
come on our panel and ask the questions directly. And uh, try to have your video on because we want this as a is a, a requirement because we have had some people being mischievous, as you might have seen in other podcasts on other channels. So try to respect the decorum of the forum as well, and be respectful and be point be to the point. Don't try to make your questions really long and unnecessarily. Okay, so I put the link in the description and also it's pinned. So if you guys want to join. Uh, sure. I, is there any questions you've spotted on the chat yet that might be useful to ask? Yeah, I think I, I saw one question earlier. I think it was for Brother Ferdos. Um, I don't know if it's helpful, but he was saying that how do you deal with fake ex-Muslims? Okay. How do I deal with fake ex ex-Muslim? Yeah. Now, first and foremost, uh, we have to determine uh, what is I mean, we do not know exactly what is their objective, being a fake Muslim. They might even not be a Muslim in the first place, but try to pretend as an ex-Muslim. So we have to uh, understand that, okay, why they want to pretend as an ex-Muslim? Number one, they got to benefit from it. Number two, they got to benefit from it. Number three, they got to benefit from it. <laughs> so basically... Those people who pretend to be a fake ex-Muslim, they definitely got a benefit from it. Okay? Yes, I'm just joking. There is three, but basically it's the same. Okay? Because nobody would try to pretend as a fake ex-Muslim if they do not benefit from that effort itself. Okay? No way. So, having said so, how do I deal with them? Number one, now, if the objective is to save more people, so sometimes... Let a small loss take place to prevent a greater loss. Despite it's important for us to save one soul, but there is a time in which we have to we have to expose their evil objective, which is to devour people. We have a lot of people who claim, "Oh, you know, I'm an ex-Muslim." Some people do approach me before, huh? You going to become a Muslim? Hey, you know, I'm an original Muslim. I'm a born Muslim. I don't even pray. Okay, and now I'm leaving, I have left Islam. And you become Muslim, you don't know what you need. Normally, if such a people, what do I do? I will say, number one, you are leaving Islam, it's not the loss of Islam, it's your loss. Your loss is my gain. Because you do not see what I see, because you refuse to see. you born as a Muslim because... And then from there, because you are born as a Muslim, you do not appreciate Islam as it is. Okay? You never really explore. If they claim, no, I have learned. Okay, what have you learned? Let me ask you some basic questions about Islam. If I have really tested them with some very basic questions about Islam and they fail to understand, and they fail to answer me, then I say, now I understand why you left Islam. Because of your own ignorance. But there is still a time for you to repent if you want to. But... If that particular person refused to repent and keep on being aggressive, what we need to do, we have to expose them publicly. I, first and foremost, I will try to do it privately in order to save him first, to try to talk to him first. But then, if needed, I will expose this person to say and to tell the world that how stupid this person, he told me that he left Islam, and now I understand why he left Islam, because of this, 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 this. So, people who are thinking about leaving Islam, they will start to think twice. I don't want to follow stupid people like this. And for some of us who are watching live, we might think, oh, that is a bit harsh, man. How can you deal with people like that? Then I will tell you guys, if you guys realize, there is a book published in the United States called After the Ball. Okay? It's in 1990. In which that book discusses about how to normalize gay in United States of America. How to legalize, how to normalize it. And one of the way is that to demonize those people who disagree with the ideas of gay, that gay is normal, to demonize them and label them as stupid, as backward, and yeah. as extreme, whatever you want to call them. So the masses and large will not follow these people who oppose their ideology of LGBT. Okay, so sometimes 
in dakwah, this is something need to be done. And I can fully comprehend and agree with the approach by Brother Mansur and Hashim and our brothers and sisters in, in Hyde Park in Speaker Corner because there is a time in which you have to expose the mischievous, their objective, their evil objective of trying to demonize Islam and ridicule of Islam. But sometimes you have to raise your voice and prove to the world how stupid they are to have that way and the principle of thinking. And that would be one of our approach, inshallah. Jazakallah khairan. I just want to highlight that important question that is been asked here. Do you all have plans to collaborate with all the organizations throughout the world to have bigger media broadcasts like to make film or games about dawah in creative way to attract people to Islam? Make films? What do you mean like games or films? movies? Mm. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that's it does help. It's all part of media. So if you look at the the movie, the message, uh, mashallah, I think it has a lot of good information in it. Because nowadays, I think um, many people just rely on video consumption, consumption because they don't um, read books anymore. <laughs> so unless there's a video, and that too, it has to be a short one, it cannot be a long one. So it does appeal to a lot of people. I think many of the people in um, Generation Z or something like that might want to adopt this. I'm not saying everyone, obviously, I'm not trying to stereotype, uh, but it's something which is, I think, in this age of information in uh, mass media, it's, it's it's quite beneficial. And yeah, if there are, uh, what do you say, um, if there are people out there with this particular skill set and they wanted to collaborate with us, if any way we could help, yeah, I think that'd be great, inshallah. Not too sure about the games, but I think there are many duat who would actually uh, want to go into that arena as well, because uh, games are, again, something that attracts young people, and they are into it. And if they can give da'wah through that means in the halal way, then yeah, why not? I mean, as long as it's within the confines of the Sharia, within the confines of something acceptable in Islam, then it's it's acceptable, I think. It's it's something that's beneficial. What do you say, Brother Fedos and Kalim? I think uh, about uh, coming up with movie, uh, Brother Yusuf Tremor, he, he came to Malaysia and we have few discussions as well in his hotel and uh, we have the same same program as well. Uh, I think he, he came he come up with a with an with idea with a project uh, of a movie, okay, a movie project. Uh, but uh, of course, when you talk about movie, you're talking about uh, huge funding. You're not talking about 1,000 pounds or 5,000 pounds. You're talking about millions. Yeah. Okay. So uh, it's not something cheap. So for us, as uh, we would say, a small organization here in Malaysia, our goal is to achieve sustainable dawa. And how can we do da'wah in the most cost-effective and time-effective way? If to spend 10 million, and I could possible possible reach out to one, 10, 10 million people, meaning there will be one pound per person to reach out to. But then by using the same amount of money, can I possible reach out to 100 million of people? If the answer is yes, and the effectiveness is plus minus will be the same, then I would rather to use the 10,000 pound if I have the 10,000 pound, okay? And to do it in a way that I can reach out to more people with plus minus the same impact. And as a, this, is, this is the way of business. I mean, being a businessman, we say this is the way how we think, okay? To invest our money the best and to get the best ROI in return. Yes, we do come up with the ideas of travelogue and we have, pro we, we have shoot few travel log, but uh, unfortunately, we have not yet aired it in our local TV station. Hopefully, by this year, we will be able to come up with all the editing. We finish our editing, and then we will start to publish. And myself have uh, involved in a uh, travel log before, uh, where we talk about the most in China, 13 episodes. So those are one of the ways to showcase uh, the dy dynamic of Islam throughout the world. To the public so talking about games um i'm not so sure i think uh, i have to first i have to pass that to people who have yeah 
Okay. Um, just like Allah, I'm going to bring some guests in who are waiting. Um, so let's bring them in, inshallah, one by one. And I would request uh, guests who are joining to make your question very brief and then one question, please. Oh, oh device not connected. Um, we've got some issues. I think okay, they so I've got some questions from the chat while they're fixing their issues. One of the questions is uh, let me go back to the question. This is brother to brother for those how to do dawah and at the same time it doesn't affect the relationship with non-muslims okay how to do dawah and at the same time it does not affect our relationship with with, with muslim uh with a non-muslim uh it, it depends basically a lot of people thought that doing dawah it would jeopardize your relationship with your friends who is not yet muslim yes yeah, sometimes it does not because uh not because uh we the our approach but because the bitterness in the truth okay i mean if people are very comfortable with you meaning we have not really doing dawah because my ideas about dawah is about if prophet sallam, the best of man there is still people who hate him amongst his own family members and relatives how about us does the prophet sallam, use a wrong approach He's being hostile, he's being aggressive, he's being rude in his approach. No. Prophet Sallam just used the right approach. Okay, good words, good words and gentleness. But yet people still hate him. People hate him not because of who he is, but because people hate the message that he brought. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in the Quran, Oh Muhammad, you feel sad? They are not rejecting you. They are rejecting me. Rejecting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, of course, for us doing da'wah is to use kind words, gentleness. Okay, the best that we could. But sometimes, brothers and sisters, we have to remember, when we speak the truth, sometimes the truth will hurt them. And then eventually, without us knowing, it jeopardizes our relationship. And let me share with you one example of mine. A very personal uh, example. Alhamdulillah, uh, three years ago, my mom became Muslim. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. And you know, doing da'wah to your own family members is among the most difficult one. Yes. Okay? And you can just imagine, if let's say you guys born as a Muslim, to talk to your own parents and correct them about their practice of Islam is difficult. Now, how that is Islam and Islam. And now, me being a Muslim, talking to my families, who is not yet Muslim. How about that? Far difficult. Far difficult. But yet, I try to maintain the relationship. I try to speak with gentleness, with kindness, and try to treat them well and even better. Okay? But truth has to be presented. Truth has to be presented. And the way I present to them, my objective, what is my objective? My objective is, I hope... Allah will guide them because I love them. Remember when we are doing da'wah, we do not do da'wah out of hatred. Because we love them, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say, you do not enter paradise until you believe and you do not believe until you love for your brother what you love for yourself. So, I love for myself, Jannah, and I love Jannah for my family members and people who I love. So, I have to present to them the truth. And when you just imagine Chinese, they love to use this argument when we talk about religion. Ah, don't need to talk about religion. All religions are the same. No, this is the part where a lot of Chinese reverts to Islam in Malaysia are struggling to answer. It's a simple question, but struggle to answer because they are like, <clears throat> how? I know all religions are not the same, but if I answer yes, then I cannot do da'wah anymore. If I answer no, it will make them angry. What should I say? How should I say? But yet, I choose to say. And I choose to answer them by telling them, all the religions are not the same. Because if all the religions are the same, then the teaching and the belief and the practice should be the same. But now, it's not the same. And for me, being a Muslim, and the reason why I become a Muslim is because I believe only Islam is the truth. 
and any other religion beside Islam is not true. And those people who profess other than Islam, according to Islam, they will not enter paradise. Now, how about this? Some people might say, oh, this is so harsh, man. How can you say this to your own family members? But I say, well, our relationship is still okay. It's still intact. So sometimes we have to understand we do our best, use the best on intonations, use the best of words. But then uh, if they dislike us, it's not because of make sure they hate us and they dislike us not because of how we say, but rather than what we say, which is based on the Quran and Sunnah. If they hate us based on what we say based on Quran and Sunnah, it's not your fault. They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting Allah. If they hate us because of the manners and the way we speak, then it's our fault because we use a wrong approach. Wallahu a'lam. Barakallahu fee, barakallahu fee. Um, I'm going to get some more questions in very quickly and I'll ask Brother Kaleem to take those questions if you don't mind. And in the interest of time, um, if, if you don't mind, let's make it a little bit briefer, inshallah, so we can get more questions in, um, if, you, if you do allow me for that. So this is a question about how and what approach of dawah should we use towards liberal Muslims? And there was a question similar to this in terms of this is, if I can find this very quickly, this is about... <laughs> That's fine if it's similar, man. So you can yeah, just so slightly yeah, because just basically saying what to what level of knowledge you need to approach to give dawah. Um, here it is. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Different questions. Can you show the second one again? I think that's um, that's what different, is that isn't it? And the earlier one was for the liberal Muslims. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Go ahead. Okay, so you want me to answer both or just answer one the other answer one? Both. An answer both. Answer, answer both. Answer both. Please. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'll answer first the second question. Like what is yep. the level of knowledge that which one has to acquire uh, to answer questions on Islam or to gain the confidence of doing dawah? I think even during the course of the discussion, I brought up this point, uh, quoting the verses of the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which I would like to repeat it again. The Prophet said, alayhi salatu wassalam, in the hadith of Sahih al-Bukhari, volume number four, hadith number three, four, six, one. Ballighu anni walaw ayah. Convey from me even if it be one single ayah. So if you know correctly from the Quran or from the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, then it is your duty because the Arabic word used there is ballighu. You know, for those of you who know a little bit of Arabic, it's fairly amr. It's a command word that which Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has used. It's not an option. It's, it's a compulsion. It's a necessity. That if you know even a single ayah, then you ought to present it. Yes, of course, there are certain uh, you know, foundations of dawah, like as we have discussed it during the course of this discussion, like you have to be gentle, you have to be sincere first and foremost. You have to use hikmah which is also, mashallah, the name of the channel Dawah Wise, doing Dawah with Hikmah, which Brother Firdos explained to say the right thing at the right time, in the right place, the right amount, in the right way. This is Hikmah. So use Hikmah and all of this, inshallah, put together will uh, give you the confidence to start speaking. But if you want to continue to pursue your studies, which is not an option again for a Muslim, Talabul Ilmi, Faridatun Ala Kulli Muslim, every Muslim has to continue to seek knowledge until he or she, uh, you know, uh, goes into his grave or her grave. So based on that, you grow in your knowledge gradually. Take the knowledge from the Quran, the main source, start learning it with understanding. Read the seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And, uh, you know, there are, mashallah, so many good books which in, are available in English language, in Bahasa language, in other languages of the world. You can refer to them, increase your knowledge gradually. And also the other thing in Dawa, especially, which I pointed out to earlier, again, I'm saying it, don't go with the flood of questions being asked about Islam. First, learn the most common questions, then go to the next set, then go to the more difficult ones, then go to the more difficult ones. And Alhamdulillah, this way, inshallah, you will gradually gain that confidence. And if you are staying in Malaysia, then I would highly recommend you 
to attend our courses KMD Kursus Methodology Dawa, which in English is Dawa Methodology Course. We have, mashallah, this course on weekends, on Saturdays and Sundays. This is uh, divided into three phases. You will learn for, in the first phase, mashallah, the most necessary, the basic foundational tools and the motivation to do dawah. The second phase, inshallah, you will be given the confidence of how to communicate with people confidently using the soft skills, the communication skills from the Quran and the Sunnah. And the third phase will help you to actually learn how to organize your dawah and how to speak to different madhus, different prospects coming from different backgrounds and what are the necessary questions to ask and what answers to give. So I would highly recommend you to do that and continue watching. As Brother Hashim said, today is the age of information. Today, not seeking ignorance or not seeking knowledge, it's a choice, which means you made the choice not to seek knowledge. The social media is available. The channels are there. MashaAllah. There are, uh, you know, YouTube channels like Dawa Wise, SC Dawa. We have Brother Firdos's channel in Bahasa. And we also have Fakir Ilmu. So there are so many arenas that which you can explore to learn the knowledge of Islam today on the very click of a button on your phone. So there is no excuse for that. So that is about seeking knowledge and gaining confidence. Be associated with the Dawah, uh, which is nearest to your place in your community, as long as it is based on the Quran and Sunnah. Be associated with them, learn from them, be associated with the masjid community. Uh, you know, we can give a lengthy answer for this, but I believe, inshallah, that should be sufficient. Uh, coming to the next question about Before how... Before you go to your second question, inshallah, I'm going to take a quick uh, Maghrib prayer break so that we can take in turns, me and Hashim. So I'll see you shortly, inshallah, and tafaddal with your answers. <laughs> okay. Uh, the second question, uh, as was mentioned, was how do we do dawah with liberal Muslims? First and foremost, my advice to every da'i or every Muslim is... Do not jump the gun to answer the question straight away without defining the terms. Now, you have to know who is a liberal Muslim. How do you define a liberal Muslim? If liberal Muslim means the one whom Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala describes in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 143, that these are the people who are on the middle path, liberal which means neither going to any extreme. One extreme of, you know, or leaving altogether Islam or the other extreme of becoming a too much hyper, you know, hyper in your uh, religious uh, zealousness. So then we have to define what is the meaning of the liberal first. And then we have to, inshallah, build up our answer basically on that. So defining the terms is very important. Like some people may say, uh, modern Muslim. What do you mean by modern? Modern Muslim, if you mean using modern technology, which are halal, which are permissible, alhamdulillah, all Muslims should be modern. So please do not jump the gun in answering any question before you define what you actually mean by it. But as I know, the questioner who must have asked this question had a specific group of people in their mind who are the liberal Muslims, so-called Muslims, who want to mold Islam according to the so-called liberal values of the Western world. And I'm sorry to say, we have, mashallah, very good brothers from the Western world as well. As we know, not all of the things of the West can be blamed or can be put into a negative light. We have Muslim Ummah communities living there. So, but basically, these are the people who are molding Islam based on the so-called liberal values of the Western world what comes from US, what comes from the European Union, and that has become their standard. So for such people, I would advise them, go back to the source, what is it? Where do we seek our knowledge of Islam from? As a Muslim, if he's still a Muslim who says, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, then we have to go back to the basics. Allah tabarak wa ta'ala says in Surah Nisa chapter number 4, verse number 59, Allah says, Ya ayyuhal lazina amanu, O you who believe, if you have faith, Allah, obey Allah, Ati'ur Rasul, obey the messenger, which means go back to the Quran and the Sunnah. Wa ulil amri minkum, the ones who have the authority or the experts in the knowledge of Islam, seek the knowledge from the true scholars of Islam. So this is the approach that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to us. 
if if there is anything not related to the deen matters allah has given us the freedom as allah says in surah nahl chapter 16 verse number 43 surah anbiya chapter 21 verse number 7 fas alu ahla dhikri in kuntum la ta'lamun if you do not know ask the experts so nobody is stopping you from learning knowledge coming from the west which is not against the principles of quran and sunnah explore it our religion has encouraged us to learn knowledge which is beneficial any beneficial knowledge the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam always used to make dua to allah allahumma inni as'aluka ilman nafia and this ilman nafia is not just restricted to the knowledge of the quran and the sunnah any knowledge that which will benefit you as an individual benefit the muslim community then alhamdulillah go ahead with it so we need to make sure we define the terms we need to make sure that what values are we taking what is the source of knowledge that which we have to go back to and that is how we build up the conversation and if he has truly some uh, iman and faith in his heart and he doesn't disagree on the basic principle of learning knowledge from the quran and sunnah then inshallah things would be much more clearer hope i answered that question yeah barakallah uh, fake beautiful response mashallah we got a guest in the background we'll let him in inshallah next gen assalamu alaikum brother you need to unmute yourself next gen can you hear us uh, assalamu alaikum uh, brother mohammed welcome back you're muted you're still muted yeah wa alaikum salam um, i just step away to attend to some family duties so no, uh, fine, do, yeah. do apologize. it's the middle of the day here so i do apologize but okay. alhamdulillah i have been listening uh, so i haven't actually missed the wonderful advice and and uh, the generous sharing of knowledge that the brothers have been doing so alhamdulillah alhamdulillah barakallahu feek brother so I, i don't know if next gen is listening next gen you need to unmute yourself to ask a question all right any Okay so I think brother Hashim we have some connectivity issues. Um what I'd like to do is just pick up on on I think one of the topics earlier that you mentioned which is how do you not upset your non-muslim counterpart that you're speaking to. So I think there's a, there's a, there's a, a very delicate line that you need to travel because the, the and again I I've seen I mean I've been involved in this now um uh, in my own way for uh, at least a couple of decades. and the sort of two or three approaches that i've seen people use in this respect the first one is one of well islam is like what whatever you do you know you know we like this we like this so everything's the same and the problem with that approach is the individual on the other side will say well i'm comfortable with what i'm doing then i'm comfortable i'm fine if islam is exactly like what i'm already following then why should i listen to what you're doing because i'm already doing it so there's a danger there that if you go and go down the road of look how like what you're doing islam is uh, in, and i know this is done with good intention that you want to show them that look we are kind we are generous we are kind to our parents we you know we have a lifestyle that is that has meaning etc etc and you know so do you well in that case you're not actually challenging their position so you need to be careful with using that approach too much as we say in the world of business don't over rotate on taking the position of the other side the second way is we have this issue where it's always attack you know criticize so what you're doing is wrong this is not right whatever that also has its dangers because the, if it's not timed correctly then you can come across as attacking somebody who actually believes what they believe genuinely believes it right mm-hmm. now and and this this is i think for me one of the interesting insights i've had over the years is Look, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, has installed inside everybody a fitra. A fitra that wants to believe. The fitra that wants to search out truth. And in the absence of any other knowledge, that fitra will actually latch on to whatever is available to them around them. Right? And in the absence of that knowledge, knowledge what they believe will be just as strong in terms of internal feelings to what we believe right the attachment the love etc will be just as powerful believe it because it's coming from the place of fitra so when you go and approach somebody like this you have to remember 
that you're asking them to change some fundamental beliefs at the very deepest level of their heart. If they are a true believer in what they do. Right? If they are a true believer in whatever they're believing, this is how, and what happens is, this creates what we call a level of cognitive dissonance. And cognitive dissonance, the reaction to that, can sometimes be very, very emotional. They will lash out, they will scream, they will shout, they will, they will maybe in some cases even um, accuse you of causing problems, right? When it was not your intention. So this is, you have to be wary of this. And this, and the third point, I think I'll go back to what, what uh, Brother Fadal said earlier. This is where your ability to be mindful of the situation, to read the person in front of you, how are they behaving? What is their response? What is their body language? What is their facial expression? And to then make sure that you address those signals appropriately. Sometimes, I mean, and we know this from our own, I mean, from our own interactions, 70% of the conversation is actually nonverbal. Right? And well, we know this, right? Because if you if you switch the cameras off, and you just listen to somebody's voice, you will not get 70% of the conversation. So this is proven. So this is why when you sit in front of somebody, stand in front of somebody, make sure you're observing their expressions, their eye expressions. And, and, and there's something the psychologists refer to, which they call, there is the, the big expressions that we all know, but there's micro expressions as well. Some things that only our consciousness picks up. And these are very, 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 very small movements, which some, you know, people say, I have this sixth sense that I knew he wanted to accept Islam, right? Or I knew he was beginning to understand. Well, this is your, your sort of consciousness picking up on those micro signals. And when you have that feeling, recognize this and, and steer the conversation appropriately. So this is what I would add to the earlier conversation, inshallah. Jazakallah khairan. I've got a guest waiting. I'm going to bring him in. Assalamu alaikum, Brother Sadiq. Uh, wa alaikum assalam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Uh, so, uh, actually, I'm from India. So, uh, my question is related to liberalism. Uh, see, uh, there are Muslims here uh, who are, in order to oppose BJP, they are shifting uh, towards liberalism. So, I'm kind of worried about them and I know a lot of people who are, uh, I mean, who portray themselves as liberals, um, liberals more uh, rather than as Muslims. I mean, they do call them as Muslims, but they, uh, they believe liberalism to be more valuable than uh, Islam is. So how do we approach these people? I'm, I'm, in fact, uh, I relate to them as... Uh, I mean, I, I consider them consider them no different than uh, the guys who supports Hindus, uh, the Hindus who supports uh, atheists and those who are, I mean, Islamophobes to be to be precise, uh, because uh, uh, they are Muslims who pay the liberals uh, to oppose BJP in order to, I mean, uh, they their intention is to oppose BJP, but in order in order to oppose them. They are actually uh, promoting liberalism. So, what do you have to say about it? And what, as a Muslim from India, uh, what can I do? Jazakallah. I think uh, I I would uh, on behalf of Kalim to answer this question, inshallah. Though uh, no, I mean, uh, Brother Sadiq, uh, Jazakallah khair for your questions about the liberalisms and. Uh, uh, certain political issues as well. Although we try to stay away from talking about political issues, but uh, as uh, during our introductions, we have mentioned that Jawa is about Amma Ma'ruf and Nahi Munkar. Okay? Amma Ma'ruf and Nahi Munkar. Now, so having said so, what is re the reality that's happening there in India? Uh, Sadiq Saifi, I, I'm not sure how much you are aware about the movement which is under the RSS over there and I'm not sure how much do you know about I hope hopefully this is something which is global okay it's happening global I, I believe that you have heard about the ideas of Akhan Barat Akhan Barat is like greater Israel but this is Akhan Barat 
which is for India, the Greater India. Okay. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Okay, you you do. And have you heard about the ideology of Advaita Vedanta? Uh, well? Vedanta. Vedanta. Yes, I do a little, not much. Yeah. Advaita Vedanta. Advaita Vedanta. It's not Vedanta, but Advaita Vedanta. Now, uh, now. Uh, we, 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 we try to stay away from, from this topic, but a, again, when we talk about how to deal, deal with certain Muslim over there, now, those are not the problem which is only uh, special uh, to India. I think uh, every part of the world, where whenever you have a Muslim, there is a, such, a, such a problem arise in which you are dealing with liberalism among the Muslims. Now, let's talk about certain things that we can do to deal with them. Again, number one, those people that we call as liberal Muslim, okay, they are what they are trying to do, like what Brother Khaled had mentioned, is about they're trying to change Islam to suit their own whims and desire and to please their master. Definitely they have their master. They claim they are Muslim, but definitely they are master. They are getting paid or they are getting benefit. They are enjoying the benefit of being a liberal. For example, they will be invited by certain group of people or by media on the speaking engagement in which they will get a certain face by writing a book about Islam, how Islam should change, how Islam is irrelevant, how is this, how is that. But in the same time, they will try to camouflage it by saying, no, Islam in a nutshell is very dynamic, is very good. But there is just a certain element of it. Okay? There is just a certain element of it which have to be changed. Now, how do we deal with such such a group? I think in, in Malaysia and in India, we have the same problem. In Indonesia, in uh, all part of the world, we have the same problem as well. How do we deal with people? A Muslim, okay? How do we deal with those people who claim to be liberal? Now, number one, when we are dealing with a liberal, bring them to a common ground. Bring them to a common ground, a neutral playground, in which we get a certain understanding. Okay? We have... We need a certain yardstick. Again, I always love to bring people to yardstick. When you have the yardstick, then there's something to discuss. Because over here in Malaysia, we engage with a lot of liberal as well. But we realize one thing in which they are refusing to listen to other people's opinion and keep on insisting on their opinion to be true. That is the main problem. Okay? And me personally, in Malaysia because you didn't follow what's happening here in Malaysia, me personally, I have filed a lawsuit against someone for defaming me. Because initially, she is the one who invited me and challenged me for a debate in which I duly accepted her, her challenge. But then, she pulled out from the debate. And then, she's, she wrote a lot of things. She wrote something which is defamation in nature. So, I do a lawsuit. So, if let's say in India, you have the opportunity or any part of the world, anybody who is slandering you, then just file a lawsuit because those people, they are honestly speaking, throughout our experience, they are not interested in a healthy discussions or even a debate. They have no ground to debate. They have nothing to debate. Okay? It's just on an empty ground. So, for those people, it's either legal action, lawsuit, if they were to defame you, or to answer their question without mentioning their name and do not make them popular. Answer, answering their shubaha and to answer in such a way to tell the masses that this ideology is observed not only by Islamic discipline, but by human common sense as well, is illogical. It's illogical. Okay? You have to prove that you have to prove that the way they think there is a problem and those people who have that kind of ideology, they have some, I would say, stupid. You have to do so. Sometimes you have to be nice. But generally, how you need to deal with liberal, as far as I know, there is only two, these two ways. Of course, some can be very humble and accept our, uh, our ideas exchange of ideas but we are talking about general no they are not interested in that but on top of that brother sadiq please keep yourself safe in india because you know what is exactly happening there in india okay with the rise of rss with the hindutva okay and then you know the bagrangjal okay 
a lot of things happening. The Hindu extremism, Hindu one is an underreported group of terrorists in the world, which was listed under FBI as a group of terrorists, but it was legalized there. Okay, and Muslim can be just not only Muslim. A lot of people thought Muslim are being oppressed in India. No, 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 no. In fact, Christians are being oppressed there in India too. Okay, any non-Vedic religions. They are being oppressed there in India. They can sugarcoat by showing certain aspect of the goodness, but we know exactly what is that, what is happening there. And they are not doing that in India too. They are doing here, right here in Malaysia as well. Those group of people, they are not doing that in India. They have their people here in Malaysia too. They have overseas citizenship of India as well. We have Malaysian who is double faced as well. We know that as well. So we are dealing with it as well. So for us doing dakwah is amma ma'ruf and nahi munka. We cannot allow them to spread their ideologies. We have a group of people here in Malaysia, Hindus, but they have such a guts and courage, okay, and to call and to question he Indian who became Muslim. And they even provide legal support in order to get them out of Islam. They have become so blunt. They have become so blunt. Even here in Malaysia, Muslim majority country. And I speak... Right now, as of now, knowing very well, they might be watching this live as well, in which I don't care, okay? And I would love them to make any report if they want to, because there's nothing they can report. Because the moment they lodge a police report, okay, we will share all the evidence. And for them, who are watching right now, who are trying to make fun, rest assured, you can start to delete whatever evidence you want. But rest assured, all the evidence we in MRM in Malaysia, we have a track record of exposing terrorist movement, a cult movement, missionary movement here in Malaysia. Okay, and most of them, if not all, the authority have taken actions against them. And if let's say those Hindu sympathizer here in Malaysia trying to make fun, trying to have fun by lodge a police report, rest assured, delete whatever you want. Whatever video you want, we have already kept all the evidence in our storage. And okay. the moment you lodge a report, when the police come for investigation, you, those Hindu sympathizer, will be exposed immediately. So do not try to be funny here. Sure. Okay. 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 okay, it's a very comprehensive Please answer. Please answer with. your question. Okay, brother. Uh, Sadiq, assalamu alaikum. Thank you for you know asking a question. Inshallah, we'll. See you again with another question on another stream. Okay, assalamu alaikum. Yeah. Wa alaikum assalam. Jazakallah. Jazakallah. Okay, we, we have to... next our uh, guest, Brother Ali Muhammad. We're going to bring him in shortly. Okay, Brother Ali, do you want to come on the stream? And oh, sorry. question. Uh, assalamu alaikum, everyone, uh, all the panels. Uh, I've got this salam. question. Uh, from uh, one of my WhatsApp groups, so, and the question goes where uh, one of the obstacles is having that uh, the uh, different scholars of opinion in uh, doing da'wah. So some say it's far, some some say it's uh, sunnah. Uh, and are these uh, differences of opinion, uh, especially in inside of our Muslim, is being an obstacle to do da'wah? Uh, hope that you can share uh, your uh, what's your experience okay. and how to mitigate this. Maybe sure. Brother Manso and Brother Hashim would like to answer that. Let us be the moderator now. <laughs> no, no, we are the host. That's that's the benefit <laughs> of the host. <laughs> <laughs> Brother Ali is Masha Allah is one of the volunteers for us. So he, oh, Insha Allah. Uh, is directing this question to our brothers from the other side of the world. So please. We are still the host, bro. I'd like to be the guest. <laughs> yeah. so, broadly speaking, there's always going to be issues due to our affiliation with a particular manhaj or a way that we conduct ourselves within a fiqhi principle. So you cannot... Uh, come away from these differences and these differences is something that has been recognized. So Muslims wherever they are in when it comes to fiqh, you know, masail in jurisprudence they will adhere to a particular methodology 
which are all of them um, in principle are based in the Quran and Sunnah. So the differences will remain. Um, we hope that it wasn't the case, but because of the way the methodology uh, is is used and practiced, there will be these nuances within, uh, you know, the different madahib or the manahaj, the manhaj, rather. Um, so the question remains now: How do we, as Muslims, when we want to invite people to Islam, invite in a way? you know, ignoring or not really thinking much of our, our differences. What you will find is, broadly speaking, there are two camps. One camp is who thinks that, no, you cannot unite with batil, with people of bid'ah, ahlul bid'ah or deviants and so on. So you have to invite um, working only with the people who are on a particular manhaj. Okay. Um, so that is a very strict um, interpretation of this, and they will only closely work with this. And the other camp is who don't take this very much, um, you know, as much of a significance and say we can still, you know, put our differences aside and walk towards inviting people to Islam because we are not invite, asking them to say, okay, become a Shafi'i or a Hanafi or a Maliki or a Hanbali. We're not asking them to join this camp. We're inviting them to bring people back to the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and save them from the hellfire. But that doesn't mean that we give them the understanding that you can, you know, invite while working with the Batil, the people who are like the Ahmadis or the Qadianis or the Druze or the, and so on and so forth, which are by unanimous agreement within the Muslims across the globe that are outside the fold of Islam. So only the difference is, I mean, are we going to focus on our differences of fiqh, of jurisprudence, and then somehow make us disunited? I mean, I would broadly say no. These are differences in how you practice your or do your amal and your actions. But when it comes to aqidah, of course, you need to be united in aqidah. Just if, if you didn't believe Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is the last messenger, last prophet, then how can you collaborate with them and unite with them? It will be very difficult in principle. So you will see even within the scholarly community, they are divided. So if you find that you want to or you have to work in collaboration with these differences, you know, set these differences of jurisprudence aside and focus on the topic of bringing people Islam on the the agreement that we have on Aqidah. Um, if you cannot, then of course, I mean, these are your personal uh, approach that you have to take. But in, in general, if you look at the Speaker's Corner model, you will find within Speaker's Corner, Muslims themselves who have different affiliation in terms of the particular juristic uh, interpretation, whether we are Hanafis or Shafis or Hanbalis or Malikis in terms of how we pray Salah and how we make our wudu and so on and so forth, it doesn't make mu much difference in working and collaborating together, okay? Because we don't consider these to be an issue in which it will create this division within Muslims because it's a recognizable difference of opinion within jurisprudence. But when it comes to issues with people who are coming with these ideas of like, I am a Quranist or a Quraniyun, or I don't, I'm a Hadith rejecter, or you know, anything like this, which you know that they overstep the bounds. Of course, you cannot collaborate with them. You, you will be the ones to invite them back to Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. So, in principle, yes, Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah is an umbrella community in which there are acceptable differences between us. Any, if you want to add anything to it, I'm more than welcome to, please, brothers. But that's that's my approach and understanding. We would not, um, what's it called, put down brothers because they follow the the first camp of strict interpretation, or we would encourage the second one. I mean, if everyone to their own understanding of this, and you know, what and wanu al birri wa taqwa doesn't exclude Muslims who are inviting people to Islam just because you know we have these fiqh differences between ourselves. Inshallah, jazakallah for the answer. Because uh, sometimes in majority Muslim countries, Muslims are the one who, you know, restricts Muslim uh, other Muslims to do that way itself. They maybe not be happening in the minority Muslim country, but in the majority Muslim country, Muslims are restricting Muslim themselves. Jazakallah yeah. for the answer. Barakallah fi. Thank you for coming in and joining this question. May Allah reward you. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullah. Assalamu alaikum Right. Now, I had a few other questions from the chat. Um, okay, I'm going to highlight just one, one, one if, if, if you're familiar with this. To the brothers, 
Bangladesh has a big problem in dawah. Are you aware of any team who do dawah work there? So if I, if I may ask uh, our Malaysian team, are you working on the ground in Bangladesh or do you know any teams working there? Uh, particularly, I'm not very sure about that. Um, we, we never been to Bangladesh. So, yeah, not very sure. I think there's a very much uh, pressing need of working on the grounds there, especially with the political climate when the the Muslim activists there are being arrested or being stopped from preaching any modes of Islamic activism. So what it needs is, this is a political uh, divide and as well as sectarian divides there. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done in terms of you know, uncovering the mist uh, you know, that is already happening within the scale in, in Bangladesh. People are falling victims of political sectarianism, people are falling victims of liberalism, people are falling victims to the ideas of atheism and so on. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done, inshallah. So if, if any of you are listening who are from Bangladesh, as you know, I speak Bangla and I'm from there, we can collaborate, inshallah, and start doing something, um, maybe producing some work together. So do send us an email at dawawaisgmail.com and let us know what uh, you know what you're very good at in terms of in terms of your qualification and expertise and knowledge base on this subject so we can work together and take this forward in terms of helping at least or alleviating some of these problems in Bangladesh inshallah so send us an email at dawawaisgmail.com there might be a potential for maybe dawawais bangla in the future inshallah yeah the other question uh, related to, again, problems people associated with dawah is here. This is a question I can ask Brother Kaleem. My best friend is Christian and my heart doesn't give me permission to speak to him. So I don't get upset and ruin our relationship. So how basically, how do you approach a very close friend of yours and you don't want to upset them and yet you want to invite them to Islam? That's a good question. You know, I think that goes back to what uh, Brother Fidos was talking about uh, so your family and your friends, it's hardest mm -hmm. to give dawah to. This is jihad al-akbar, basically. You know, it's, it's quite difficult because they are close to you. You don't want to lose them. You don't want to upset them. Uh, so what do you say, Brother Kalim? How do you give dawah to a close friend uh, with the, what do you say, with the possibility of upsetting them and possibility of maybe jeopardizing that friendship? Okay. Uh, I would first and foremost say, that if he's your close friend, then you would definitely want him to be saved from the fire of hell. And for that, you have to agree that Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala has said in the Quran in Surah Al Imran chapter 3, verse 19, and Surah Al Imran chapter 3, verse number 85, in in the Allah in Islam. And Allah says, that Allah has clearly defined to us that any person who comes with any other way of life, any other religion other than Islam, on the day of judgment, he will be among the khasirin. So if you truly consider him to be your close friend, as you mentioned that he's a Christian friend, then they are too into kufr and shirk as Allah tabarak wa ta'ala has mentioned in the Quran in Surah Maida chapter 5 verse number 72 laqad kafara alladhina qalu they have indeed blasphemed who say that Jesus is Allah so basically if you truly want uh, to maintain that friendship not just in this dunya but as well as you want to remain his friend in the akhirah then definitely you have to call him to Islam. Give him the best gift that which you can give him is not the material gift of this world or not the other, uh, you know, or daily chores of life that which you are helping one another with. The best help, the best gift that which you can give to your non-Muslim friends and family is the gift of Islam. And how do you do that? is alhamdulillah by following the major you know characteristics and what are the foundations of dawah that which you need to learn which has already been discussed in this discussion so hope that answers your question i think the last bit is what he was looking for how do you approach your friend or your family perhaps 
in giving. I think uh, Brother Fredos has got personal experience with his mom, so yes. maybe he can on that as well. <laughs> uh, so you know, um, dealing with uh, I understand uh, from that perspective in which uh, is very sensitive and is like a tiny path. Okay, is in between you know, love and hate, peace and war, as people say, right? So coming to this. How do you deal and how do I deal in, in, in such a situation? First and foremost, you have to establish the confidence, the conviction first. You think that friend of yours is your good friend. Well, good for you. But do you know and have, did he ever say to you that he treat you the same and he think you are the same as well, that you are his good friend and best friend as well? If yes, then Alhamdulillah. You know how I started my conversation with my mom? Is that I started and I changed my tone and my intonation in which I told her, I said, Mom, I'm happy that you are my mother in this world. I'm so blessed. And then she said, yeah, me too. I'm happy that you are my son in this world. And then I told my mom, I say, Mom, I hope... You are not only my mom in this world, but you will be my mom in paradise too. I cannot say, say Jannah because you don't understand what is Jannah. So I say in paradise too. And then my mom say, you see, I, 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 built, I built that con con conversations. I do not immediately just tell everything. I, I wait for her, for her response. And then she say, yes, me too. I hope you will be my son too in paradise. But then unfortunately, I have to break the news. I told my mom, but mom, according to Islam, you cannot become my mom in paradise if you are not a Muslim. Now, how difficult was that? And I told my mom and my dad as well, I say, uh, is your son is inviting you guys to hellfire or paradise? And both of them say, no, 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 you, you are doing good job. Despite during that time they are not not yet Muslim, no, you are doing good job. You are ask, you are you are teaching people how to be a good person. Obviously, you are ask, you are inviting people to paradise. I we believe so. So I said yes. So likewise, if I can invite people to paradise, I'm inviting you guys to paradise too, together with me. And this is my conviction. I do this because I love you guys, not because I hate you guys. Likewise, uh, to to the brother just now, one of the way to talk to your friend is that. You have to first tell him to establish the value. Tell him that, brother, so ever, if his name is John, John, I appreciate our friendship. You know, this is a friendship that I treasure the most. Wait for his response. Do not immediately say everything. And then wait for his response. If his response was, oh, but I, I don't really treasure our friendship, then there's nothing to say, actually. It's just that you are, you know, they, you, you, can, you can only dance with two. Okay, so you can only tangle with when there's two person. So there's nothing much to say. But normally, if you really believe that he really treat you as a good friend, then he will obviously say, oh, well, bro, I, I treat you as a good friend. You, you are my good friend. So this is a friendship that I treasure the most, man. You know, you are the my best friend ever. You are my BFF. And then you say, yeah, you know, I love you so much as my brother, as my friend. Oh, is it? Are you gay? No, no, I'm not gay. I'm just telling you, express my love towards you as a brother, a brotherly love. And you know what? In Islam, our prophet, do not say my prophet, because when you say my prophet, it's not his prophet, it's your prophet. When you say our prophet, you say, you know what? Our prophet, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, okay? He say, I cannot enter paradise if I do not have faith. And I cannot have faith if I do not love for my brother, like you, what I love for myself. And you know what I love the most? I love to go to paradise. And I hope that you will be going to paradise too with me. And, and I have to tell you this. I love you so much as my brother. Okay, And therefore, I'm inviting you to go to paradise by becoming a Muslim. If you do not become a Muslim, unfortunately, I know this might hurt you. But I do this not out of hatred. I do this because I love you as my brother. If you do not become Muslim, 
And unfortunately, according to Islam, I will not be able to see you in paradise and you will not enter paradise too. Well, just say it. You have to use a softer approach dealing with your friend. There is a certain way, certain dialogue, certain script that you have to follow. Okay, it's not everything you have to say, everything. No, 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 not, not necessary. You have to build it. You have to build the momentum. You have to find the right place. You just don't say this out in the place which is too crowded. Okay, that you have to yell, you have to shout. <laughs> you can't. How can you use the intonation that I used just now by shouting? You can't. So you must find the right place where both of you can talk and make give him time to think. And sometimes this invitation might caught him by surprise. In which he was like, wow, I didn't see that coming, bro. Me too. It took me a lot of courage for me to talk to you just now. And that's only for one reason. Because I want you to go to paradise. That's beautiful, mashallah. And you need a lot of patience and don't think it's going to something happen overnight. And okay. you will cry. I, I <laughs> cry. Yeah. I cry when, when, when I spoke to my mom that way. Yeah. My mom cried when I told her that, you know, you will not enter paradise if you are not a Muslim. You know, I cried and she cried. So Even funny. now when I, when, I, when I just re-narrate the story, the history, you know, it's goosebumps to me, man. You know, it's, some, you to, it's something you have to feel. It's something that you have to feel that that one is all about. You love that person. You want them to enter paradise. You don't hate that person and invite them to your party, man. You don't. You it's like the person. Yeah. That's why you want to invite them. So you have to make it something personal. That's why you have to customize it. It's not just quoting and quoting. Sometimes with your sincerity that you express through your facial expression and with the choice of word and with your intonation, you do not know that you might be able to touch their heart and Allah will guide them. That's how it works. You know, mashallah, brother. And you know what I would add there is, is that these conversations can take months and years to happen yeah, please don't think that you know one meal one discussion khalas we're done this is not how it works i mean allah turns the hearts of people we are simply delivering the message and and just as brother for those so eloquently said it is about your behavior your kindness and and showing them what they will lose what they could lose if they don't listen to the truth but it, it i mean i have a friend that I, I was speaking to for probably 15 years on and off 15 years before he he finally said you know there may be something in this this was this was the best i could get from him was okay and then i, I and then a few years ago um, i gave him a copy of the quran and i and he says you know when i when i have problems in my life i leaf through it and I find that it says good things. And this is how we left through. I, I left it because I said, look, he's softening. And that's enough. I mean, for now, I mean, maybe in two or three years, if Allah allows, I'll have another conversation with him. But this is how you need to deal. With this. this is very, very gentle process. And at the end of the day, this is not about, you know, ticks on the board of how many shahadas we got or anything. Because at the end of the day, you know, and there was a, a, some metrics that I read a few years ago where if you go down the model of collecting shahadas, <clears throat> the challenge is, is we also do not know how many people down the road apostate because they entered for the wrong reason, right? It was not their heart. It was because they liked yeah. you, you know, because you had a nice voice or they liked the samosas you made for them or the biryani you made for them. You know, people don't join Islam because of the biryani or the samosa or whatever you cook for them, right? And what happens? Next time they have a bad samosa, they leave? I mean, come on, guys. I mean, you know, next time somebody cooks them a burnt biryani, that's it. Oh, khalas, that's it. Islam is untrue. No, 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 no. You see, Islam is true. Whether you are here, I am here, we are not here, it doesn't matter. Islam is true. And when we, we call this, you know, we call this a concept called absolute truth. Right, and and this is the other thing I really want to say is when you when you can get to a stage in the conversation where people are sort of really sort of saying, well, how do I know what you have is true? You need to say that we you need to really explain to them that we have an idea of something called absolute truth that is anchored in divine reality, 
and we can prove it to you, right? No other text out there makes that claim. The Quran makes the claim, says, this is revelation from Allah. It then explains who Allah is, Surah Ikhlas. It then says, if you don't believe, then here's the evidence. And even then, it, and then it puts a challenge, saying, if you believe this is not from your Lord, then bring something like this. And for 1400 years and more, the best minds on the planet, and I say this to my own, you know, when I have my own discussions, you know, I, I work in, in, I've worked for quite a while in, in technology. I say, look, my challenge to you, bring the very best artificial intelligence you have. Bring all of the professors on the planet that you have to gather together that know Arabic. Put them all in a room. And I guarantee you with certainty, they will not produce anything like the Quran. And I can say that with one, I'm, I'm not being arrogant, because this is Allah's challenge. Right? So this is the level of certainty we have. Allah has said nobody can produce anything like this because it's from Him. On this basis, we can now say, therefore, the person Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose, Muhammad Wasallam, has to be telling the truth. This is your next question now, which is, was he truthful? Was he a prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? If you can establish these two things, then anything else they bring, which you know, masala you, which which masala you follow, which fiqh you follow, which school of thought you follow, these are secondary tertiary questions. These, are, if you start with these secondary tertiary, you know, questions, without really addressing the foundation, you can end up discussing for a hundred years and not get anywhere. Believe me, right? Establish okay. the foundation. Khairan. Um, we have our last guest, uh, Brother Imran Khan. Assalamu alaikum to you. Tell us where you're joining from and please uh, make your question very brief. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, I'm Imran Khan from Pakistan, residing in uh, Abu Dhabi. So, actually, I have okay. one question. Uh, uh, the question is, uh, I, I was asked by, like, uh, actually, my English is not too good, so sorry for that in advance. A question was asked by a Hindu guy from me. Like, he was telling me, um, I mean, I, I don't know exactly the topic also because I joined late, but the question is, like, he was telling me uh, why the Muslims are not following their religion properly, but they are ready to die for their religion. Like, he was giving me the example, for example, uh, even in Pakistan, if someone say bad about our religion, like, you know, like, uh, bad things happen to them, then, but, like, he was generalizing the whole community, like, telling me that Pakistanis are not following the religion as they should have, but they are ready to die for it. They are ready to kill for that or die for it, like this. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for your question. Um Go ahead, brothers. Okay, Brother Khalib. I thought you were going to ask a question about cricket, Imran Khan. It's been a long time since I stayed awake for such long hours. So suddenly everything is getting muffled. I know, I know. It's late. Sorry, guys. It's been four hours. I can't believe it. No, we, we, we have no problem, Hashim. We have made the promise, remember? You ask us how, how many hours, I would say, no problem. We are okay with that. And you know what? We, we have we have, <laughs> we have exit. Uh, Dr. Zakir Naik Dr. Zakir Naik talk ended 12, 12 o'clock just now. No, <laughs> just, <laughs> just ended, I guess. <laughs> so they, they started after us and ended before us. Wow. <laughs> Okay, this is the last guest, uh, Kalim Bhai, so yeah. and we have crossed. Okay, fine. I'll keep it brief, inshallah. To answer Brother Imran's question, uh, we all know uh, that there are black sheep in every community. Every community has that, whether it be Islam, the Muslims, or the Hindus, or the Christians, or any other religion. Every community has their own black sheep. So, unfortunately, even in Islam, there are many Muslims who do not, uh, you know, practice their religion completely. And there are the black sheep in the community. 
But having said so, Islam is also the religion where, mashaAllah, majority of the Muslims, alhamdulillah, they abstain from so many other evils that which the non-Muslims are involved into. Like, for example, the Muslims, they do not imbibe alcohol as a whole. There are Muslims as a whole who do not practice zina or adultery. There are Muslims as a whole who do not you know, do other things that which are haram. But having said so, these are the other things, peripheral things that which we are discussing. Now, your main question was that Muslims not practicing their religion, but willing to die for Islam, willing yeah. to sacrifice themselves for Islam. We have to know that Islam, first and foremost, is founded on the basic foundation of La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. That there is no deity worthy of worship but Allah and Prophet Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. And after having said this, we are giving a commitment that we will stand by this kalima as long as we live. And if required, we also fight and we give up our life for this kalima. And this is what the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, we know from the sunnah, that they did not do a single deed. They did not even pray a single salah. But they said, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. They joined the battlefield and Alhamdulillah, Allah wa ta'ala blessed them with shahada. So yeah. just on the basis of the kalima, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, the greatest and the strongest foundation of Islam, we Muslims are willing to live by it and we Muslims are even willing to die for it. Because Islam foundation is on this kalima first. Yes, there are many other things in Islam that which we are supposed to follow. Some Muslims are practicing 90%, 80%. Some may be practicing 60, some may be practicing 30. So we are either practicing Muslims, less practicing Muslims, or we may be non-practicing Muslims, pseudo-Muslims, just Muslims by the namesake. So what we have to see is not judge Islam a religion by what Muslim individuals do or a group of Muslims do. We have to always judge Islam by its authentic sources. The authentic sources of Islam are the Quran and the Sunnah. And if you really do want to judge who is the best practicing Muslim to judge Islam by the practice of a people, then as the Mansur earlier pointed out too, when Hazrat Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, was asked about the character of the Prophet, she said, Kana khuluquhul Quran. His character was that of the Quran. He was a walking Quran. So if you really want to judge Islam by the character of the people, then the best example is what Allah wa ta'ala gave us in Surah Hazab, chapter 33, verse number 21. The best example to follow is the Prophet Muhammad. So judge Islam by the Quran and by the seerah of the Prophet and not by individual Muslims or a group of Muslims who may not be practicing the religion completely. Hope that answers the question. Alhamdulillah. I, yeah, I just want to bring w w w one last thing in there. So what I would add is, is I think what Brother Hashim mentioned at the beginning, which is actions are judged by their intentions. And for individuals, as you mentioned, these black sheep who are doing these things, we have no idea what their intention is. right? So for us to assume that for some reason they are doing it for Islam, I don't know. I mean, maybe they're looking for glory. Maybe they're looking for, you know, their 15 minutes of fame on YouTube. Maybe they they have nothing else to look forward to in life. So this is the way they want to leave their legacy, right? We have no idea, right, why these black sheep do what they do, right? So uh, I think, you know? uh, and complete, exactly. So I would say, look, on, on the one hand, I think attributing these acts by these black sheep to Islam first of all is, is mistaken assumptions, let's not do this because we don't know what's in the hearts of people and secondly at the end of the day the judgment is down to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he will judge on, on the, you know, and he says you know, one of the first to go into the hellfire will be you know, uh, of those people who uh, were martyred for, for, for the wrong yeah. reason right? so uh, look uh, I think good question but what I would say for people asking you that question is say, look, we don't judge people's intention, intentions and uh, we don't, we do, we can't pass judgment on what they did was good or bad. At the end of the day, only they know and Allah knows. And for us, we try our best to play out, you know, do what we do as basic, you know, simple Muslims. We do the best that we can. 
you know, and, yeah. and, and that's the best we can hope for. Okay, yeah. Barakallah I hope this answer your, answers your question, brother. Thank you for joining, and uh, inshallah we'll meet you again in another yeah, question. Thank you, very much for your time. Uh, thank you very much for your time. I like uh, exactly. Dr. Uh, Hashim video very much. I'm watching him since two years. Actually, this is my first debate. Uh, I, I watched uh, from the speaker's corner, Brother Hashim debate. I like him very much, and uh, thank you very much for all for all of you for this question. Thank you. Okay. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Mashallah, it's been a very long stream keeping you awake, brothers. Um, but what did we get? Subhanallah, so much amazing and beneficial knowledge and information um, within this collaboration. And this is exactly why we need to collaborate sharing and exchanging information, sharing and exchanging ideas and concepts so that we all benefit. This is a mutual benefit in which we benefit ourselves and we benefit our audience, our readers, our listeners, our viewers. And we hope that these collaborations continue east and west, north and south, wherever it may be, so that inshallah Muslims come back united again so strongly in this bond that we can do this dawah, we can bring this light of Islam to the people. Even though they may be sitting in their homes, we can take it there, inshallah ta'ala, with our collaborations. So any last thoughts from our, you know, respected panelists or our guest, um, starting from uh, Brother Firdos, inshallah, just your final thoughts and comments or any ideas, concepts on your future projects um, that you have in mind. So please share it with our audience. I guess... Um... For us to have this live stream itself is a is an achievement because when we look at the uh, the clock is we are close to four hours and thirty minutes, mashallah, yeah, of this live stream. So, huh. mashallah, uh, I, I'm not sure if this is the longest ever that you guys have ever have. I'm not sure. Okay. It, that's not a comp we don't compete on that. That's, that's not a good thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's um, about the anyway. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, would, I, would, I would say that uh, you know we have basically previously we have uh, unofficial collaborate uh, by translating your video, but I think uh, you know now we are moving uh, one step further by you know working closely, uh, not only on translating the video, but in terms of uh, exchange of ideas, exchange of knowledge, exchange of expertise that can benefit the dawah and large. And uh, I think we have also discussed about uh, to collaborate on the, the encyclopedia as well, in which both of all of you guys have your expertise as well. So it would be good to have a different answer and to, have, to, uh, to let you guys look at it uh, and have a different view. So we can try to have an encyclopedia which is comprehensive enough, inshallah. Okay? We cannot say is a, I mean, every answer. There will be people who try to, you know, poke hole into it. But alhamdulillah, you know, we try to make the best out of it. And I hope there will be more collaborations between Dawah Wise UK and us, uh, MRM in Malaysia. One day we would like to invite and have you guys here in Malaysia. And of course, one day I will hope to be there in the speaker's corner with you guys, inshallah. Together with Kalim. Yeah. Brother Kalim. Alhamdulillah. First and foremost, all uh, praise be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he made this live stream, alhamdulillah, uh, possible and successful. Hopefully, inshallah, may Allah accept it uh, for the efforts that which we have put in. And I hope the audiences have benefited from different, uh, you know, uh, continents, both from the Western world as well as from the Eastern world. Uh, I hope everyone has benefited from this live stream. And Brother Firdos has already mentioned, mashallah, what I all too wanted to speak about like this relationship that which we have built in. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala strengthen it more. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, you know, unite our hearts and let us work on our strengths. Let us try to overcome our weaknesses. Let us, you know, become that ummah that which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam described. A Muslim is to another Muslim is like the brick. So we strengthen each other. And if we have any issues, we have any challenges, then inshallah, we know that we have our brothers now in that part of the world, Brother Hashim and Brother Mansur, who will come and help us in it. And if you guys have any challenges, we are always there, alhamdulillah, from this part of the world, anything, 
for the cause of Islam, for the cause of Dawah, then Alhamdulillah, we would be most welcome to help you guys. So in the end, uh, I will leave with one small advice. I will make it quick. And this is the advice that which our mentor, Dr. Naik, has always given to us, that <clears throat> to make our effective our Dawah or to achieve success in anything that which we do in this world, there are three formulas to be followed, and all three come from the glorious Quran. The first and foremost is the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As Allah tabarak wa ta'ala says in Surah Ali Imran, chapter number three, verse number 160, If Allah helps you, none can overcome you. But if Allah forsakes you, then who is the one who can help you? So let the believers put their trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So my dear brothers and sisters, here in the panel, all those who are listening for this live stream, remember that the help of Allah is with you. You can achieve anything in this life. I'm not talking about flying in air, but inshallah, all those things that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has enjoined us to do, especially dawah, the most important thing is the help of Allah. And how do you get the help of Allah? This is the question people usually ask. The answer is again given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In Surah An-Kabut, chapter 29, verse number 69, Allah says, وَالَّذِينَ جَاهَدُوا فِينَا لَنَحْدِيَنَّهُمْ سُبُولَنَا Those who strive, those who struggle, those who put in the effort, sacrifice you know people want easy you know things easier way but yes our religion is easy it promotes ease but we should also be willing to sacrifice for the sake of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his deen and this live stream mashallah for four and a half hours i believe we allah accept our, our striving that which we have done in this four and a half hour uh, you know uh, stream so the second thing is the more you strive the more of a help of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will come to you and lastly is we all know that we have loopholes, we have our weaknesses. And how do we overcome that? Allah says in Surah An-Nahl chapter 16 verse 43 and in Surah Anbiya chapter 21 verse number 7. Fas'alu ahla dhikri in kuntum la if you don't know, I, Kaleem, cannot claim that I know everything about the religion of Islam, every approach of da'wah, which is the best. If I don't know, be humble enough to learn that approach from our brothers Hashim, from brother Mansoor, from the other brothers from the speaker's corner, from brother Firdos, from Dr. Nayib, from the other stalwarts who have already you know, left this world. May Allah grant them Jannah. Learn from them. Learn all approaches. So learning from the experts is a part of the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the most important being help of Allah and the second being the striving in the cause of Allah. With this, I conclude. Wa akhiru dawana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin. Brother Hashim. Yes, Alhamdulillah. Beautiful stream, uh, though it was long, but a lot of topics were covered. Alhamdulillah. And inshallah, this will be a beginning of many streams, not only with the MRM, uh, Brother Fitos and Kaleem and the team, but inshallah, other people or other teams in, in the other parts of the world as well. So it's kind of Dawa globalization, <laughs> if you want to call it that. <laughs> but with all the positives and without the negatives, inshallah. Yeah, one of the things that I want to mention is sometimes, you know, there are other teams which might work a bit different from you. So please do not be suspicious of them or try to have some crazy assumptions about them. Because uh, Allah in the Quran in chapter 49, 12 in Surah Al-Hujurat says that much suspicion is something that is sinful. Yeah, no, uh, do not have no, 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 no. because some of the suspicion is sinful. And this is something we should, you know, try to get to know them, try to understand them, try to un understand their methodology. Maybe it is better than yours, you know. You never know because you haven't, you have never come across what they do and why they think it's successful. So, inshallah, we take the good from the different teams of du'a out there. Uh, we try to have a look at different models. I don't think the Prophet Wasallam left a very specific model that says, okay, da'wah has to be done this way. As long as you follow the Quran and Sunnah and uh, ulama, inshallah, Allah will put barakah in that. So don't have suspicion about others who might follow a different method. Yes, as long as they're following uh, is within the boundaries of Islam, inshallah. So I would like to thank uh, um, 
special thanks to both of you, uh, Barakul Lafik and Jazakul Lakhir, Brother Firdos and Brother Kalim. We look forward to the collaboration and inshallah, Allah put Barakah in that. And mm -hmm. thank you for all the listeners for your patience uh, for more than four and a half hours. May Allah put Barakah in this. Uh, Jazakul Lakhir. Barakul Lafik. Muhammad. Alhamdulillah, that was a, I don't know what else to say, um, but what I'll, I'll, I think I'll say just three very simple things, which is, first of all, the aim or the goal of da'wah is to spread the teachings of Islam in their pristine purity. And it is to enlighten the people who do not believe and to correct the beliefs of those who are mistaken. And the Prophet ﷺ said, you know, Islam began as something strange. And it will return as something strange. So give glad tidings to the strangers. The Sahaba asked, O Messenger of Allah, who are the strangers? And he replied, those who rectify themselves and others when people become corrupt. And this is the age we are in. So the goal of da'wah is to really follow through on those two prophetic messages. And as it says in Surah Nahl, verse 125, it said, call to the way of your Lord, call. And da'wah has three three objectives. There is the call, there is the caller, and there is the one being called. And no matter which model you follow, these are the three things that are fundamental to every model. So do not view others' approaches or other approaches with suspicion, because they are they are doing what is prophetic at the end of the day and calling to the cold. So, Jazakallah khayran, akhir da'ana wa alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Barakallah fi. I don't want to prolong any more. Subhanak Allahumma bihamdik. Ashhadu wa la ilaha illa anta wa astaghfirka wa tubu ilayk. Assalamu alaykum.